All right. Hey, what's up, guys? We have Joseph Talent here. He is a shark biologist. So, hey, Joseph, how are you doing today? Doing great. How about y'all? Good. So, yeah, first of all, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? We we just met today or yesterday, so I know yeah, very Brandon. little about you. Yeah, we, yes. just, we just, luckily, we, you know, we, we were able to do it right away, which I like. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> I got my undergrad in marine biology. While I was working on my undergrad, uh, I had the opportunity to start tagging sharks off the beach side with uh, NOAA's cooperative shark tagging permit. Um, they gave us dart tags, which are just, you know, small little numerical uh, plastic tags that we can put in the sharks and that goes right behind the dorsal fin. And, you know, it just gives us an opportunity if that shark is recaptured, another angler can put that into the database and we can understand, you know, where that shark traveled to, how much it grew within that given period of time. Um, I did that for about four years undergrad. I continue to do that for about two years with a government agency. And then with the government agency, you know, we were tagging them off of boats and we were comparing that data with uh, sea turtles that we were also tagging. So when I started working with the government agencies, we were putting GPS, um, acoustic tags, and all those uh, types of tags on sharks that were primarily uh, predators for sea turtles. So we were trying to understand, you know, a sea turtle prey predator relationship for that uh, project. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't know too much about. Actually, I don't even know if I knew what shark. I mean, I think I've, I feel like I've heard of a shark biologist before, but mm -hmm. I don't know if I even knew that there was shark biologists. Um, so yeah, I don't know too much. But um, however, I do fly drones, and my goal in life would probably be to capture a shark on a drone because those videos tend to go viral. And yeah. then um, I also used to be like a surfer, so you know, I'm aware of. I'm aware of sharks. You kind of have to be, you know, you have to be aware of your surroundings. When you're <laughs> Definitely. Out there. I mean, yeah. the biggest thing is, uh, you know, there's definitely a big push right now with like, Oh, sharks are our best friends. Sharks are this. No, they're, they're still apex predators. We still have to respect them. You know, the, the sharks are put on this planet to be the top of the food chain. You have to respect that shark. You have to know what you're dealing with when you get in the water, you know, that there's a big push where, you know, Yes, we need to protect shark populations. Yes, they're critical to the environment, but we still need to be aware of what a shark is. You know, I'm not going to jump into the ocean and give a big bear hug to the next tiger shark I see swimming across from me. Um, yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of like an even balance with animals, right? Because a lot of people just want to save all the animals, but then you have the Joe Rogan types who want to kill them, and and they they make you know they make good points who are like when they say stuff like if we don't kill certain animals, like they will kill us. I don't know if, well, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but like with certain animals, if you don't kill them, like they'll, they'll just be too much of them. And like, you won't be right. I don't know if that's, that's yeah. probably not the case with sharks, but. Well, I actually ran into, <laughs> so apart from sharks, I also work with the sea turtles, primary loggerhead sea turtles. So I was working one day in the middle of the bay and we had about three loggerhead sea turtles on our boat. And, you know, we have a big, you know, 20 foot research boat says research on the side. And this charter fisherman comes up speeding up next to us. He's like, you need to just get rid of those sea turtles. You know, they're catching on and they're eating all the seagrass and we can't catch any fish anymore because the sea turtles that you're researching uh, are eating all the seagrass. You know, in that moment, I want to be like, well, maybe you just need to be a better fisherman. But, you know, you can't say that to them. It's just going to piss them off more. And, you know, they're going to be more against what you're doing <clears throat> as a job. Um, Yeah, I definitely run into that a lot where, like, the species I work with, people want to get rid of. Um, It's just part of science nowadays. Yeah, and, like, like, also, it's, like, you kind of, I could see, like, maybe being fine with killing sharks, but, like, killing sea turtles seems kind of, like, mean. Right? I mean, it's, like, see, I mean, I guess he had an issue with them, but, like, you know, sea yeah. turtles seem like so nice and like just sweet yeah. or whatever that you don't want to. My friend calls in the uh, the gateway drug to conservation. So you have the uh, sea turtle, polar bear, and like what other uh, like nice cuddly animals are, you know, your gateway drug into people wanting to get into like wildlife conservation and like wanting to protect species. But as you grow as a scientist, you start realizing like, 
oh, you know, sharks are also uh, indicator species. So we can look at shark populations on a, a reef and deduce from what black tip uh, reef shark populations we have can also tell us the health of that reef. So if there's not enough bait fish for the sharks to eat off of, they're going to die off naturally. So it gives us a good way to look as scientists at certain reef populations. So yeah, as a fisherman, I, you know, I, I'm an avid fisherman. I go out in the Gulf of Mexico, go fish. I go out in my backyard and fish as much as I can. I fish anytime that I'm not you know, actively working, I try and go fish. Yeah, it's annoying when I catch a snapper and a little black tip reef shark eats my catch, but you know, it, that is just, you know, a reality of fishing nowadays. Yeah, for sure. And so going back um, to the beginning, when you said you tagged it, well, first of all, like, so um, you have a bachelor's in uh, marine biology, right? Yep. And so like, what, what does, like you mentioned that you were a scientist earlier beforehand, what, like, what does it take to, you are, you would consider yourself a scientist, right? Yeah, I mean that's what my paycheck says. <laughs> okay, so what what does it take to be able to like consider yourself a scientist? Like I thought maybe you have I don't even know, but maybe you have to get like a master's or a doctorate. But what is the yeah? What is the um... yeah? Um, man, the word scientist is so far fetched. Such I mean, I work with people doing the exact same job I do, um, and they have their doctorate, they have their masters. You know, I'm one of the younger guys doing what I do. Um, so I, my, while I was still as an undergraduate, I was working with the park services, you know, normal, like typical nine to five. And I got in contact with this guy who was, you know, just recreational, you know, charter fishermen catching sharks off the beach. And I contacted Noah, got, you know, through this program, you know, he was working with this program already getting tags through him. So we started getting tags in. And after I would get off of work from about 6 p.m. to about 2 in the morning, I'm sitting on the beach waiting for a shark to hit our line. And I started doing that as an undergrad. You know, eventually I graduated, got my degree, and then I knew some people with a government agency, and we started tagging sharks. They just wanted to start the shark tagging program. So for me, it was kind of like a luck of the draw, you know, good timing. They wanted to start shark tagging program. I had about three years of tagging sharks professionally, and we could start that program to coincide with the uh, sea turtle data that they've been collecting for about the last 20 years. So, you know, the word scientist can apply to anyone. You know, we were big on citizen science projects. So we had guys that were just driving down the road and you'd see a box turtle on the side of the road and they would jump out of their car, grab it and call us up and we'd go out and give them little tags and they would tag little box turtles. So, you know, realistically, anyone can be a scientist. You don't have to go to college to be a scientist. If you want to do it professionally and get paid for it, obviously, just like with any other thing, got to go to college, got to get the education, got to get your time in. But the word scientist is pretty broad nowadays. I think a lot of citizen science projects are kind of making science more transparent, and more accessible. Yeah. And then as far as the, the tagging goes, so that's the pretty much sounds like the majority of your job is tagging these, these sharks. And um, yeah. So what do you, you like, how hard is that process? What are you using to tag them? Um, you know, um, and then also other... where, where are you located? If you don't, you don't have to say like the exact city, but like Gulf um, of Mexico. Okay. Gulf so kind of like Southeast. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, North Florida, Gulf of Mexico. Okay. And um. Yeah. So when you're, yeah. So what do you, what are you using to tag in, for tagging them and how hard is tagging them? Uh, you know, I would imagine it would be pretty difficult, right? Yeah. So it also depends on the species. Um, it's a completely different ball game when you capture a nurse shark compared to a hammerhead shark, you know, a gray hammerhead shark will start producing a, a certain acid in its liver around 30 seconds after being in a high stress situation. And this acid can actually kill the shark. So, you know, once we catch our great hammerhead, which is the primary or one of the primary target species we were working with, cause they predate on sea turtles, um, you know, time's definitely clicking. It's definitely a different time. It's a different stress 
on us as biologists to capture the shark, get everything we need. We're taking skin samples. We're putting the tags in. We're trying to release this shark as fast as we can compared to, you know, a nurse shark. There's not much we can do with a nurse shark. You know, most of the time we're just taking the hook out and letting it go. Um, with that project, you know, primarily we're just looking for tiger sharks and great hammerheads that primarily feed on sea turtles. Okay. And then what are you guys looking to do once you tag them? Is it kind of like, just is kind of like see how they're migrating? I don't even know. Like do sharks migrate <laughs> yeah. or like, um, kind of like see what they're doing down there. Like we're trying so group, to like learn about them. Yeah. So the group I was with, they were primarily sea turtle biologists. They had been doing that for a long, long time before I was around and they wanted to start trying to understand more of the predator prey relationships with sharks and sea turtles. So they were already putting those GPS tags and acoustic tags and these different type of tags on the sea turtles. So you could compare the sea turtle data with shark data and understand predator and prey relationships. So, you know, it would have been cool to see like big tiger shark we had tagged comes into the bay and then the five juvenile sea turtles that we already had tagged, they all just split because they recognize there's a big predator in the area. So it's kind of like stuff like that, you know, as you know, we just tried to see what the relationship between predator and prey was like for that given ecosystem. Okay. And you mentioned that they are the kind of like the alpha, um, what's the word? Like the, um, the most They're dangerous alpha predators. Yeah. The alpha predator. Yeah. Would you say that they are the most alpha predator or what's yeah. the term that i'm thinking of the um apex the apex predator but like where they eat like they eat the they, they eat everything else basically like yeah um, so tiger sharks were probably the apex predator for the given really uh ecosystem we were working in you know tiger sharks famously are the trash cans of the ocean they're gonna eat anything that's in front of their face we uh we caught a 13 foot uh tiger shark on a piece of mullet it was about that big you know, the, the, these guys and gals are, they just love eating. You know, it's a different type of a uh, predator looking at it that way. Okay. And I feel like there's, I live in like the Southern California area and I know there's sharks down in San Diego that you can go like swim with. Mm -hmm. I want to say they're tiger sharks, but they may be something else. Um, they may be like, um, I feel like they're kind of like spotted like they're, and they're definitely not mean because you can swim with them. Like, mm -hmm. um, can you think of what type of sharks that would be? I mean, usually for tourism, most people they're going to be swimming with nurse sharks. They're uh, tan. They can be speckled. Um, they don't have a dorsal fin. They're just kind of the flat, you know, tan sharks that sit on the bottom. Um, you know, tiger sharks are a little more uh, inquisitive. They have higher sensors on their nose. You know, sharks have those super sensitive nose sensors that can detect electromagnetic pulses in the ocean. And tiger sharks are one of those uh, species that has, you know, a heightened senses in that. So a lot of divers I've talked to, you know, they'll have tiger sharks when they, they got the big camera housings, you know, and they're trying to photography and do photography with underwater cameras on these sharks. And the tiger sharks are usually going to come up to those divers with uh, cameras because they can sense that, you know, small pulses in the water from their cameras. And they're going to grab those cameras and sometimes swim off with them. <laughs> So the tiger sharks are a super cool species. They're super sensitive compared to other sharks. I think probably what you were swimming with would have been a nurse shark. I couldn't tell specifically. You know, I'm not super familiarized with the West Coast populations. Yeah, I actually haven't swam with them, but I think that I just thought of it. I think it's a leopard shark, which is probably oh, a pretty yeah. leopard tame sharks are, shark. Yeah, especially with like the kelp forest over there. I forgot you had all those kelp forests. Um, yeah, leopard sharks, they're going to be just super chill guys there. Just another fish in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, so tiger sharks, I had it wrong. Tiger sharks are actually very mean then. I don't I don't think there's any shark that's mean. Um I've tagged bull sharks, tiger sharks. I've tagged a lot of different sharks other than a great white shark. And I've never had, you know, you can see I have all my fingers, I've had my my uh my hand all the way in a shark's mouth. I'm never been bit, never been attacked or anything you know that you just have to respect them in a certain way just like with any wildlife you know i'm not gonna really yeah i'm not gonna just swim up to a seal and give it a bear hug yeah that seal can bite my hand off just as quick as a shark can 
I would, I don't know. I would assume that uh, especially certain sharks will just come after anything and everything. No, right? No, no. Um, because I know a guy on Instagram, his name's like Mike. You were just saying how people will take pictures of him. This guy named Mike Coots on in the Instagram, and he takes pictures of and videos of the sharks, mm-hmm. really good quality in Hawaii. And um, his he got his leg bit off. Oh, and, I love that guy. That guy is you know super what I'm interesting. About? Yeah, so yeah. it's really cool. Like I was talking about with the uh tiger sharks being super sensitive. There's a couple pictures he has because he was initially attacked by a tiger shark as a kid i think he was attacked like at 13 years old as a surfer and he has a prosthetic leg now he has a crazy picture of him sitting on the ocean floor and the tiger shark bit his prosthetic and swam off with it it's it's that metal in the water is what they're sensing and that's why they're more you know actively trying to go for that because it's a different sensory compared to humans but yeah Yeah, this guy is super interesting well, yeah, and his his pictures and videos are just absolutely insane. But he comes off like he loves the animals, the sharks so much that even though they bit his leg off and I guess did it again with the mechanical one, he still will go out there and he still doesn't hate them or anything. Like he yeah. he still loves them, and I think it almost seems like he would even like die for them. He would die just taking pictures of them. If you know, if one killed him, he's he's willing to go that far for. I guess it's mainly just for photography, right? I don't think he's really doing anything else. Yeah, I think, you know, as, as a photographer, he also recognizes the uh, conservation impact that he has with these photos he's taking. It kind of humanizes the sharks, makes people realize that, oh, if this guy can get attacked by a shark and still swim with him, you know, maybe it's not too scary to go in the ocean and swim. Yeah, so speak, speaking of which, being a surfer, and if I ever go back, I'll be a bodyboarder at this point i think but because um, i moved inland like an hour and a half so I, i'm not able to get to the beaches but now when i go i actually do take pictures and videos when i go to the beach i still love it but um yeah. if i'm out there on my surfboard first of all should i be afraid obviously it's very rare that it happens and i think that i know that they don't come after humans they tend to go after like seals and stuff right yeah but i mean with that being said like I don't really like to be so vulnerable. Same thing. I was up in the mountains a week ago and I was like, we were walking to somebody's house in the dark, in the snow. And it was like, if a bear just popped up, I could be dead. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, even though I would love to see a bear and take a picture and yeah, I could probably run to the house, but do I want to run to the house? But supposedly you don't want to run away from these things. Exactly. Um, So even though I understand that, like you said, they're not mean, I don't think they intend to harm maybe, it's still pretty scary just to be around them because you just don't know what they're going to do. Right. Definitely. You know, it was like the Mike Coots guy, like he, they, you know, he went after him or the shark went after him. So, yeah. yeah. The, the bear example is honestly perfect. Um, I, I did a little work up in Alaska for a couple months and, you know, I encountered bears all the time, you know, an apex predator is going, is going to be an apex predator. It does not care what is in its way. It doesn't care who you are, what you are. It has been is evolved for millennia to be an apex predator. It knows what it was put on this earth to do, and it's damn good at it. And if you get in its way, yeah, you could be an issue. You could be its next lunch. You know, there's no shark that is going to go, hmm, what's on the menu today, humans? I'm going to eat a surfer for my 3 p.m dinner you know i don't think you know as humans we can do as much as we can to protect ourselves but just like driving you can be as safe as possible you can put your seatbelt on use your turn signal drive the speed limit sometimes you're still gonna get into a wreck but does that mean i'm never gonna drive a car again of course not i'm still gonna drive a car i'm still gonna go to work use a car all the time just like with a surfer just because he has a possibility of being attacked it's such a minute possibility. He's going to still get in the water. He's still going to surf. He's still going to do what he loves. Yeah, that's true. But I kind of feel like, and don't get me wrong. Like I said, if I, I still want to get out there on my, on my bodyboard, but um, at the same time, I still am like with a car, like you kind of have to drive your car, even though I could get into a car wreck and mm-hmm. die or whatever. You pretty much kind of have to drive a car. You don't really necessarily have to go 
swimming, especially if it's far out, especially in a- yeah. areas that are like kind of sketchy. Some areas have more sharks than others. Yep. So um, even though I, I totally agree with you, obviously you're the expert. Same thing with bears. Like, even though I would love to capture a bear on film, like, or, you know, film a bear, I'm going to want to do it probably, you know, far away or from the inside. I'm not just going to be like free willy with it, um, <laughs> nilly willy with it. Um, or whatever that term I'm trying to say. Um, so yeah, so um, but yeah, I totally see what you're saying, and don't get me wrong, you're right. If I was still surfing, I would still be out there, but but basically you're saying that like, yeah, you shouldn't be scared of them. And is there, I mean, is there any advice maybe? Like, I mean, what if it's like um like if you hear that there are great whites out there, maybe not go out. Yeah. And, for the week or something yeah like. so i mean i was a surfer <laughs> in my area you know florida we don't have the great white sharks you know i'm re- i'm reading my surf reports i'm talking to my friends who are going out surfing if they see something you know maybe it's not worth surfing that morning no matter how great the waves are breaking or whatever the surf report is you know look at your surf reports a lot of surf reports are going to have your sightings especially in the areas that have your bigger predatory species like your great whites your tiger sharks and everything um you just be smart with it just like hiking you know you can go hiking on certain trails that you know are more bear country or you can go to a different trail that isn't as much of a, a bear country or has the bear population like you see i just you gotta be smart with it just like with anything else you do as a hobby kind of just yeah obvious yeah obvious um common sense yeah. Um, so with the sharks and say, and also with the bears, if you do, I don't know how much you know about other animals like bears and stuff like that, but, um, if you do encounter a shark, what is the best thing for you to do if you're on a surfboard or swimming or whatever, obviously go in, but let's say you're like in a situation where you can't get in for whatever reason. I, I like to just kind of like lay on my longboard. Like, I don't even like to have my legs like dangling, <laughs> but some shortboarders can't really do that. Yeah. So what would be the best advice? I've heard with bears, like I said, the best thing is to do is, is just to like stay still. Is that also true with sharks? Maybe you don't want to get like panicky and yeah, you know, obviously, just like you said, you know, getting panicky is gonna be your biggest issue. You know, you're gonna look like a a dying fish that's splashing at the surface with a shark if you're just on your board, your short board, and just splash around. You know, honestly. If you're in the situation where you feel like you can't put your legs in the water, I don't think you should be surfing that day. If you're that stressed out about sharks and that stressed out about getting, you know, bit, <laughs> I don't think you need to be surfing that day, you know, and that that's coming from someone who did a lot of surfing in college. And, you know, I would love to be surfing some more, but, you know, my area just doesn't give me that opportunity. Um, you know, find a different beach, find a, you know, talk to your buddies. If you're that worried about it, start surfing as a group is as horrible as that sounds you know you're gonna get ran over you know going for swells and everything but start fishing or fishing start surfing as a group um power and numbers just like with anything in the wildlife yeah i totally i actually totally agree with you with the power of numbers and it's kind of like a somewhat for a sad reason but but if you think if you have 10 guys out there and a shark pulls up you're at least like well maybe i won't you know, I'm not the only one. <laughs> like, yeah, no, the, the statistical off. opportunity has gone way up for you to not get bit. <laughs> yeah, same thing if, I mean, same thing if there's just other guys. It's always kind of eerie surfing by yourself. I have i don't know if I've ever really fully done it completely solo, but if you're just mm-hmm. out there by, especially in the morning when it's like, yeah, or it's... at night, like before it's, or after sunset or before sunrise, it's, it can get yeah. sketchy out there. Yeah, I definitely have never surfed alone. I, you know, where I, went to college it was a big surf community so you know right at sunrise you had plenty of guys out in the water and i wasn't ever really worried about sharks even though you know i'd go surfing in the morning go back to class and on the weekends me and my buddy i was helping him with a uh a macro algae survey and we were going out to the artificial reefs with uh scuba gear and we were uh surveying the macro algaes for sea turtle populations how they were eating on the reefs and everything and I mean, we'd see tiger sharks we'd see sharks and everything swimming around the reefs uh i remember me and my buddy we were on the reef and it's just three concrete pilings stacked up from the ocean bottom 
and we had probably like 300 bait fish just bawling around us they're just swarming 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 and then out of nowhere they just scatter and you just hear the ocean get just real quiet because when you're just surrounded by bait fish they're they're constantly chomping that you can always just hear them and they're super loud and they just scatter and get super quiet and then you just start seeing that you know it's like an eight and a half foot little tiger shark just swimming around all the reefs and it just got super quiet but you know i'm not worried they're not going to just like come up and eat me whole <laughs> you know th- these guys are just chilling out in their home chilling out where they live you know everything but yeah, you know, there is the power of numbers. There is a reason, like, I would never go hike alone when I'm in bear country. I would never go surf alone if I knew there's shark sharks around, you know. I just think it's kind of common sense or, you know, do what you can do to prioritize yourself. <laughs> yeah, and this was in, did you go to school in Florida? Yeah. What college, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, University of West Florida. Okay, so I'm just I'm trying to wonder what like surf spots are out there. What I know of them, are there any good ones? Okay, because I've heard I've heard that like Florida isn't like great for surfing, but some of the well, maybe the surfing is true, but some of the pictures I've seen um, from Instagram and stuff are it's definitely beautiful out there. Like you know, like the water, like you said, the water is clear. Like you actually had, you know, um, fish swimming around you. Like here, like. I, I like you in California, you just won't, won't be able to get that basically, you know, like, or at least you see it because the water is mm-hmm. so dirty and that that's horrible. I think that the water, I don't know why the water out here is so dirty compared to where you guys live. I don't know if you know the oh, answer yeah. to that, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't speak onto that specific, you know, a lot of it has to do with how different plankton are migrating and following the different currents of the ocean, you know, I couldn't speak because my expertise is within Florida. I've studied Florida. I've been within Florida for most of my life. That's what I know. That's what I study. Um, but yeah, I know a lot of it has to do with plankton. Um, depth has a lot to do with it. You know, there's a lot of factors that go into water clarity. But I would imagine that a lot of it is just us polluting the ocean over here. Oh, for sure. Right. For sure. Um, yeah. I, there's a big, I like Surf Rider Foundation. Um, that's a really good foundation that, you know, embodies different surfers and they, for a while they were giving different surfers. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was these armbands that were taking water quality sampling while the surfers were out surfing. So you're just doing your normal day to day as a surfer, going out, enjoying the water, enjoying the environment while you're collecting data for scientists. So that's a way you could be a citizen scientist. Like I was talking about at the beginning of the podcast. Yeah, so like even like I could do that. Yeah, um, I don't know if the program still that was before COVID. Um, gosh, feels like forever ago. But that that's a group I recommend everyone follow. I like Surf Rider Foundation. They're based out of California. They do a lot of water sampling, water water uh, quality uh, outreach. Yeah. So, um, getting back to like the how dangerous the sharks are, I feel like we're kind of you're kind of focusing more on like tiger sharks. What about the other sharks? Like the, or do you not even know about the great whites? Like what, well, first of all, how dangerous in general are, like when I was asking you before about the apex predator, would you say that they are the most dangerous animal in the world? Or would you actually say that humans? Oh, for sure. Like, humans. Like the top of the food chain is the, oh. the what I was thinking about before. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for sure. Humans, they, uh, they specialize on uh, causing issues and causing environmental harm. You know, I, I can sound like, you know, as much as I want to uh, humans, we've kind of perfected the game in a way um, of killing. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> look at long lines and look at, you know, the fisheries population. I just, it, it's crazy to me as, as a human, we, we realize what we're doing but there's nothing we can do to stop it. Like I recognize like I should probably stop eating fish. Guess what? I like eating fish. You know, I'm going to still go eat and sushi. It's, it's a really hard mental game to play. I always tell people, you know, my parents are, you know, once you become a marine biologist, 
everyone knows you're a marine biologist and their kids want to be marine biologists. Like, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to out of high school and they're like, I want to become a marine biologist. I want to become a marine biologist. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, get prepared to be depressed. This is a depressing field to get into. It's a lot of like, we should be doing this. We should be doing that to fix the population, to fix the environmental problems we have, you know, just to speak onto one thing, you know, we're, we're about to start doing a deep sea mining and that's going to wreak havoc on the abyssal plain and the abyss populations that we know nothing about, honestly, as scientists, you know, we find on average three and a half dives, we find a new species of fish when we go into the abyss. It's such a new field of science, yet we're prepared to go out and start harvesting and mining this completely untapped area that we had know nothing about, know nothing that we're going to impact. So, I mean, this field's depressing some days, and it's also really rewarding some days. You know, it's, it's yeah, a, I feel, yeah. I feel like there are a lot of fields that are depressing. Like I, I work for Amazon. I work for Amazon. I mean, that's got to yeah. be more depressing than, than yeah. marine biology. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, sure like the, the way that day. I look at, and I want, yeah, I, I totally want to get into the conservation and then also maybe global warming type stuff. I don't know how much you know about that, yep. but um, in terms of just so many, and well, first of all, to answer, not to answer the question, but to, the way that I look at it, I think our underlying goal in life is to kind of survive, right? And I think that we're, even though we may say, oh, we don't really want to eat fish or meat or whatever, it's like just kind of in us as evolutionary animals, basically, to to eat. And not only that, but also kind of like just take over the the whole planet, right? I mean, it's like that's the goal of any animal. And it's like we are smart. Like animals aren't smart enough, I don't think. Well, they're not to know that what they're doing is quote unquote bad or good, which is a whole nother philosophical yeah. question. They're just hungry and they need to eat. At one point we were just hungry and we needed to eat. Now we're to a point where like, okay, maybe we should like, maybe we should calm down. Like, you know what I mean? Like there are starving people out there, but maybe we should for one, give those people some of the food we kill yep. and then help them out. But then two, we don't really need to be, I don't really know enough about it. You probably do, but we don't really probably need to be killing as much as we do the animals and everything else. Um, it's very, it is very sad. You're right. Um, but getting back into the sharks real quick, and then we can kind of go over this stuff more. Um, I'm just kind of, I kind of want to draw a clear line. Well, first of all, when I asked you the question of apex predator, Obviously, we are the apex predator, but we don't really look at ourselves as being the apex predator because we're quote unquote nice or whatever, right? In terms of just straight physical violence, like if it was between, if we didn't have our intelligence, we didn't have all our whatever um, guns and everything else, what would be the apex predator if it was just kind of like a, we didn't have our weapons and all that? There's, you know, you got the shark, you got the crocodile, you got the, or the alligator, yeah, crocodile, you got the bear. Who do you think? And it's kind of hard to say, right? Because the sharks are in the water, so it's yeah. a completely different landscape. I mean, if but you're what going would you water, say is the most dangerous animal out of all of them? If you're going in terms of just sheer water, violence, uh, I really, I, you know, I want to say us, or you know, like a monkey, a chimpanzee, you know, a primate. (laughs) And and the only reason I give us, you know, we got, we got this wonderful thing I can do with my thumb. (laughs) You know, I got opposable thumbs. It really is a game changer. Um, You know, man, it humans are just perfected. I mean, we have just, we have figured out the matrix. We, We, we figured out what to prioritize. We have, you know, I, I can't speak much out of the the fish population. You know, I'm not versed in that, but I really just still give the edge to us, the humans. You know, yeah, a shark in the water is going to get the upper hand if it can get the ambush on us. You know, sharks are ambush predators. If you're in the water, make eye contact with the shark. If you're snorkeling, if you're spearfishing. You know, I do a lot of spearfishing where I'm at. Luckily, I don't have a lot of shark population where I'm at specifically. 
um, beforehand where I used to work, there was a big shark population. I didn't go spear fishing. Um, biggest thing is just making eye contact with those sharks. They're, they're ambush predators. Um, they understand when you're making eye contact with them, they, they know your face is towards them. Um, yeah, I, st- I still, humans, apex predators, you know, you, you put me butt naked in a re- arena with a, you know, 13 foot tiger shark. I still think I could outsmart it, out swim it out, you know, get what I need to do to get away from it. You know, I don't have Maybe the big, you. big shark, sharp teeth. You know, I can get around it. I can get, you know, not Maybe everyone's you. like me. <laughs> not me. I mean, you don't think if so? I'm in the water, if I'm, no, it's like, if I'm in the water with a shark and I don't have a cage, I have nothing. I have no weapon, spear, whatever, um, spear gun. And that shark wants to kill me. I'm dead. There's no, there's no fucking way that I'm. And that's yeah. what I mean. I'm I'm leaving all of any, but so, like you said, you might you might know exactly what to do. Like look it in the eye, which is going to be hard in itself, right? If you don't have any you don't goggles, have if you don't yeah. have the gear on. But if you obviously you probably do have the gear on, um, I don't think the average person is going to know what to do. I wouldn't know what to do if I saw a shark. I'd probably freak out and they'd win. And it's just up to them or whether or not they want to kill me. And so as far as what they eat, right? They eat what do well, I also wanted to go over too. Like, I wanted to go over each distinction of sharks. So we've gone, we've gone to the, the um, the tiger shark. But in terms of if um, what they eat, and then also, yeah, what is the the apex shark? You, did you say it was the tiger shark? Because I would think that the uh, great white. I mean, would every be more. every environment's different. You know, you, you go down to Daytona beach, it's going to be the bull shark. You go down to Hawaii, it's going to be the tiger shark. You go down to Maine, it's going to be the great white sharks. You know, every, every environment has perfected its version of the apex predator shark. Um, you know, as far as their diet is surprisingly sharks eat other sharks. There are your apex predator sharks and then your, your, your feeder sharks almost, you know, they get ate by big sharks. You know, a lot of the diet of a shark is another shark, is another fish. You know, we we were using more of the oily uh, fish. You know, we, we found mullet did really well on uh, intr- getting sharks to come over and be interested in our bait. Um, you know, as far as food-wise, you know, tiger sharks, they love sea turtles, they love mullet, they love other sharks. You know, great whites, they love other sharks. They love um, seals. They're not actually the apex predator in a lot of their areas. Orca whale is. Orca whales will eat great white sharks for their livers. It's a super high <laughs> oily fat content. And they can just flip this uh, great white over and just destroy it. Because orca whales, they're a lot of pack animals. A lot of your apex predator sharks, they're going to be solitary. They're, they're by themselves. You don't see a big school of tiger sharks coming in. They're, they're solitary uh predators unlike the orca the whale, orc- which they're going to come in a group <laughs> so the orca is coming in a group and do they do they kind of know how to act as a group oh like yeah they base it, yeah um this is funny um when i was an undergrad one of our dive instructors was like former delta force guy and he got deployed over to the middle east and you know he did all his fighting over in the middle east he still told me the most vicious thing he ever saw was dolphin going after a school of mullet. And like the way a dolphin, a group of dolphin and a pod, it's called a pod, the way a pod of dolphin attacked a school of mullet was like one of the most vicious things he ever saw, which blew my mind. And the way he talked about it was crazy. And how did he talk about it in terms of what, how they just kind of like just yeah, ravaged so the, it? it was just the, the dolphin like... was like, pushing this mullet into the bay so you had a big bay and they were pushing it onto the beach and what and is he, what is a mullet it's just it's just like a regular fish like a fish yeah um like, you know there's freshwater and there's saltwater mullet just imagine like something about this big it's got two pectoral fins which are fins from the side it's got your tail fin doesn't have a dorsal fin and it's just got a big mouth <laughs> and you know they primarily eat on a uh, aquatic algae aquatic plants you know they're 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 not eating any fish they're not anything crazy uh 
so yeah, they're, they're going to school up in big packs of schools and they're the fish that, you know, if you're out in the Gulf of Mexico and you see them jumping out of the water there, it's always a mullet. Um, so he said this big, you know, pot of dolphin, like three or four dolphins are just pushing this mullet up into the beach and they had three dolphins on the outside of the beach. And then one dolphin would just make a straight shot through the whole school of mullet. And he said, you know, the, the, the bay turned red by the end of it. You just the way this dolphin just like meticulously took down and ate all this mullet, you know, it was kind of crazy to him, you know, the porpoise, you know, obviously have bigger brain capacity than, you know, your basic fish or shark even. Yeah. They're just, they're just smarter. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to the, the question of, because I want to, I want to make sure you, you answer this question. The, uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> The apex predator, like count us out of it. Like we're not involved. Who was uh-huh. the apex? I mean, like, like I said, I know it's hard to answer because you don't have, like, you don't have a lion with a shark with a, well, you, I guess you could say chimpanzee, right? Yeah. But, <sighs> it's hard. You know, every, you know, each environment has its own restrictions, has its own, you know, different set of circumstances that an animal is going to do microevolutions to evolve to, to be the best. Um, it's hard to generalize, you know, 70% of the earth is covered in water. So from a particular numbers game, if you want to say, okay, if the earth is majorly water, then whatever animal is the apex predator in water is going to be your apex over the majority. You know, if I threw a monkey into the ocean it's not going to know how to swim it's not going to swim well it's going to splash around and get devoured um but you know at the same time a tiger shark versus a great great white shark you know that that's really different ecosystems it's different set of parameters that you can't really compare um so you can't really give an answer it's hard it's such a general question that it's hard to give a definitive answer you know each ecosystem has its apex predator but if you took all those ecosystems and pitted those apex predators against each other kind of like a what was a deadliest warrior on spike tv where they had the, like green berets versus the spetnaz back in the day i remember growing up with that show if you had a show kind of like that it, it would be so hard there's so many different variables that would go into it Okay, and well, I guess the best way to ask the question then would be if 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 <laughs> what animal would you least likely to be in contact with? And it's just you, the animal, and you had nothing else but just your brain. Ooh. What it, what what would be the worst animal that you just think you would not survive in that situation? I I still want to say like a monkey. Like <laughs> and, and this might be showing my age, but like I remember growing up, what was that one monkey? Like that woman had a pet monkey and it like ripped that other person's face off. Oh yeah. That just like stuck in my mind from like childhood development. It was just like yeah. monkeys are scary. And then like watching but I the feel wizard like... of Oz, you know, those flying I... monkeys scared the crap out of me. Yeah, I feel like monkeys though are it's kind of like somewhat of a random thing, right? Like because you'll have a like the, you'll have those scientists who go out and like kind of like live yeah. amongst the monkeys, right? And like it's like Jane for Goodall. the most for the most part, they're fine. Like they're able to live with monkeys. Every once in a while the monkey freaks out because of yeah. something. And a lot of it has to do with like what I've heard a lot of uh, like evolutionary kind of um morality or whatever you want to call it has to do kind of like with fairness right like yeah and then joe rogan will talk about it how like if um not like he knows but like um like when um like if you have a group of monkeys and you give one monkey something and not the other one that other one gets pissed off and will just fucking like yeah go after the other monkey i'm sure that's just me like showing my ignorance i've never worked with money monkeys i've never been out to where monkeys live you know and i'm sure the people who work with monkeys probably would say same thing about the sharks i work with you know it's it's kind of the fear of the unknown maybe is where i think it comes from i still think you know monkeys have that slight edge with brain capacity with its you know i still think 
I, I can firmly feel like I firmly say monkeys are top dogs. <laughs> so you think a lot of it has, a lot of the killing has to cut comes down to kind of like intelligence. Yeah. That's what would you so say. That's, it. would you say that that's true for us? Do you feel like the reason why we're so intelligent is, is because it's all, it all comes down to killing basically. Oh yeah. And uh, we'll I, just surviving. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, killing is a sport, you know, you, you can look at it as a certain way, you know, I mean, an art form, there's an art of war and everything. We, we as a, a species have kind of perfected it, kind of figured it out. We, uh, I, I definitely think an intelligence has to come into it. I think, you know, you have to be crafty. You have to be clever to outsmart different dif- uh, animals. I just think it, it, it also just depends on the environment. You know, the monkey's not going to know how to swim in a pelagic ocean, deep water. Yeah. You know, if you, if you throw a monkey in the ocean, the shark's going to win, but you throw a shark in the jungle the monkey's going to win. You know, each of these animals have, developed for certain environments and at one point we supposedly were all in the water right according to evolution yeah and do you believe that we got out of the water basically to survive like at some point our ancient ancestors realized okay we got to get out of this water onto land if we're going to make it yeah um you know that's obviously a completely different field of study from me but like scientific evidence kind of points towards that you know like i said that's just completely different field of study from what i know and what i'm familiar with yeah yeah so um once again in terms of the most dangerous animals and i think that you did pretty much cover it but i kind of wanted to go over each not over each one specifically but just to get like list the most dangerous animals in the water would be it sounds like the orca is at the top, right? And then you got the great white. It, what's your definition of dangerous? Dangerous to humans or dangerous top, to just... Top, top of the food chain, in the water. Oh, like... or for their environment, orca is going to be your top dog. They're, they're munching great white sharks like it's a pack of sardines. So then going down the list, you got the orcas, then you got the probably the great whites, I would imagine, right? Yeah. And then what, what else do we got? You got the tiger shark. Any other well, tiger sharks aren't gonna live in, usually live in the same environment that a great white will. Um, you know, you get the odd great white shark that's gonna make its way into the Gulf of Mexico following the Gulf Stream. You know, that's always a big deal. Every time it freaking happens, I get a hundred text messages from every person I went to college with. Did you see the O search great white shark? Da 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 is in this part of the Gulf of Mexico. I'm like, yeah, we we know great white sharks will follow the Gulf Stream into the Gulf of Mexico. It's it's pretty much known by now um you know if if we're talking like upper east maine orca great white seal and then your fish um i'm not too familiar with what fish live over there but i could look it up but yeah orca is your top dog in the northeast coast okay. come down here um you know, if, if you're coming up to, you know, the panhandle of Florida, you're going to get your, your bull sharks or your top dogs, your apex predators. They love the muddy water. They thrive in it. They, they're, they, that's where they evolved for. That's, that's what they do. That's where they live. They do a damn good job of eating other fish in muddy water. Um, you go down the Keys, Hawaii, all that area, tiger sharks are going to be your apex predators. So, like I was kind of saying before, each shark is an apex predator in its given environment. It's evolved differently to be that apex predator. Okay. So yeah, it just it just basically I'm asking like not answerable questions because they're just not in the same environment. Yeah. So you can't really rate them. Yeah. The earth okay. is big. Everything's kind of evolved for their little niche of little pocket in earth. Yeah. And then in terms of well, I guess, um, yeah. So do we know about the, do you know about like the evolution of sharks in terms of like how they kind of, I know that's probably an impossible question also to answer how they got to be the apex predator also. I don't know. I'm trying to think of it from like an evolutionary standpoint, but like um, why they like, 
like why they eat what they eat like um is it kind of just like do we does anybody even really know the answer to that like oh that's a it's a good question you know that that i hate to say this uh it's kind of different field of study um my my expertise my knowledge is usually in predator prey relationships so i kind of understand why sharks do what they do behaviorally what they eat why they eat it um you know if you look at a tiger shark and if you look at its jaw set and the way its teeth are shaped they're more blunt or not blunt they're uh, shorter and they're a little sharper they're they're short teeth so it has more of a chance to get through a sea turtle shell. And then if you look like at a mako shark, who is a prim- uh, primarily a pelagic species, and pelagic just means open ocean. When I say pelagic, open ocean, deep blue water. And you look at a mako shark, you know, they got that gnarly, like sharp, long teeth. And that's because mako sharks, they're chasing after these super fast fish and they need whatever opportunity they can to just sprint open their mouth and just try and get a quick lash at this fish to slow it down a little bit, catch up and keep doing it. So that's why, you know, you can look at different shark species and I mean, just any fish species and look at the way they evolved. And that's why they live in that certain area. You know, Mako sharks, they're blue. They're, they're that nice dark blue. You can't really see them when you're looking above hand, you know, bull sharks are that dark, you know, gray brownish color for the murky waters they live in tiger sharks they've got those stripes you know that that helps with you know when you're looking up it's the sun's shining through it gives you those stripe patterns so it kind of helps it camouflage itself within the stripes because sharks like i said are ambush predators they want to hide a little they want to be able to do the quick attack and get away with an easy meal because you know the less calories that they can expend to eat you know the more they're going to gain when they get that meal. Um, as far as the question, you know, that's the best I can answer. You know, that's not my field of study exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, just kind of a basic knowledge question. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, a, yeah, it's a, like, it's a, one of those tough questions. I feel like, you know, you can ask where it's like, you just keep asking mm-hmm. like, why, 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 you know, until you get to a point where you just can't answer it anymore. But um, yeah. yeah. So in terms of the ocean itself, you know, I've heard recently that there's obviously parts of the ocean we haven't ever been to, like that goes way down deep. And when you get down there, it's just like pure black and there are animals or fish living mm-hmm. down there and they've kind of evolved to live down there. But you mentioned kind of like um, mining in the ocean. Uh, well, first of all, have we really have we have we like we want to go out and explore space, but ha- we haven't really even fully explored the ocean, right? There are parts of the oceans we haven't even been to. Do you think we'll ever get to a point where we'll be able to kind of like go way down to these areas we haven't been to? Yeah. You know, it's, you always have to do, you know, as a business, you always have to look at it like cost benefit analysis. Is it worth spending X amount of thousand of dollars to send down an unmanned vehicle down how many thousands of meters of ocean water that how many thousands of times of oceanic pressure we're going to be getting on this uh, unmanned vehicle. Um, To say if we ever will get a full mapping of the ocean in my lifetime, I don't think so only because we're not prioritizing it. Um. That you know, ocean conservation doesn't seem to always be a priority within a lot of what we do, a lot of what the government wants as far as funding. Um, I mean, I could complain all day about government funding. Um, it's it's expensive. I mean, bottom line, it is an expensive field. It's an expensive thing to get that data out of. Um, I mean, we are going to learn a lot more as deep sea oceanic mining does become more of a viable option because we are seeing there's these little nodules that are forming at the bottom of the abyssal plane and the abyss of these super important minerals like iron and all these things that go into making batteries and phones and all these 
devices that we use on a daily basis. And the ocean is creating these little nodules at the bottom of the abyss because um, due to the pressures and the way that you know, different sediments form underneath, you know, I could go into a five hour lecture onto it if I had, knew the right professor to talk to. But, you know, I did a little bit of study of this. Um, but, you know, I do think, you know, the private sector will aid in that deep water mapping and deep water exploration and discovery of different species. But I, a hundred percent mapping and understanding of the ocean, I don't think will ever happen. Okay. And why do you think we're kind of choosing going to outer space as, as opposed to going deep in the ocean? Is it because like, you know, Elon Musk really wants to get to Mars? Or is it also like the, the Starlink stuff, like the satellites giving yeah. Wi-Fi, like is makes money. It just, it's, it, it just makes more money basically. Yeah. You know, like him or hate him, Elon Musk is a good promoter. He he knows how to sell products. He knows how to generate a an excitement around products and excitement around this deep sea or deep sea deep space exploration and you know going to Mars and you know we always hear about climate change, climate change, and you know that that kind of gives a nihilist view for people who don't really understand the science behind it. And you know, as a nihilist, your your next goal is going to be you know get out of here you know get to the next place that we think could be habitable you know as a nihilist that's you know going to be mars as elon musk has proclaimed um yeah i think yeah i think elon musk is just kind of he's grabbed the right market as a businessman and figured out what is going to be the best for him in a simple way yeah the sad thing is about is about what a lot a lot of these guys these geniuses are doing um these like tech geniuses and stuff um but they like he wants to go to mars and all this stuff it's like we're probably not even going to see it in our lifetime like i mean i would imagine that like he'll never even go to mars hopefully maybe i mean i think in his mind he'll get some he'll get people to mars by the time he dies maybe maybe not yeah. i don't think so but it's kind of like okay then you get you kind of get to a point where you're like, okay, well, hopefully my kids will get there, or you know maybe their kids will get. You know what I mean? It's like, um, you know, just kind of sad that you won't even basically see the thing that you want to do come into fruition. You know? Yeah. Um, I I just think that's the game of science. You know, science is a long, hard process. It takes forever to get anything figured out. You know, a lot of people I'm probably working with, you know, might never see the end of the project that we're working on. Like I said, you know, with the sea turtle tagging, they've been working on the same project for 20 plus years. The manager for this, you know, it, it science is a long, long process. You know, sometimes these people who start the process, start the project, start everything, get the ground running and, you know, hit, get get everything going. They, they're never going to see the end of this project. You know, it, it it's depressing. Yeah. It, it is what it is, though. You know, the scientific process is a long, fickle process. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting that Mars is the new option, I guess, for Earth. When we have, when I feel like, you know, personally, we have so many opportunity here. Um, I don't know why we're cutting ties and just saying, let's go to Mars. <laughs> um, but money talks. I guess is the best way to say it. And also, like you said, I mean, it, it may make sense in, in terms of the, the real long term being thousands of years. You know, I think the ideal goal would be to like be living, you know, intergalactically or, or whatever. Like I've even heard Sam Altman. Do you know who Sam Altman is? Like the, the guy who created a, like ChatGPT. Well, he owns the company OpenAI, okay. you know, ChatGPT, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he, he I've heard him talking and that's like, he wants he also wants to do that he's he also wants to do that but it's like like i said it probably won't be in our lifetime but then like you said that's science you know um so yeah in terms of um i'm kind of like bouncing around a lot here but in terms of where the sharks are well first of all do you this is probably a stupid question but just like we want to go live out 
it, you know, out to Mars to live, which is also crazy to me. Do you think there's ever a possibility of like actually living like underwater or whatever? Because I've, <laughs> I've heard, I've heard, um, you know, there are, they, they do have like underwater hotels and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, what, I mean, but it's like, the reason I asked the question is because Mars seems just as hard to, to do as does living underwater, but I kind of feel like the living underwater thing would, would just be too complicated. Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I always, uh, I couldn't tell you my exact numbers now, but I always like to keep a running number of how many hours I've spent underwater in my lifetime. And it's, yeah. like, well, it's well over a thousand at this point, just, you know, with work and pleasure and all that crap. Um, it's a brutal place and just like outer space, you know, <laughs> th- there, there is a reason that, you know, the U S trains its astronauts on how to deal with the deep space underwater. We have these ginormous pools at NASA bases that have these mock, uh, USS space stations and, they train the divers or tra- divers train the astronauts how to you know deal with zero gravity situations you know it, it yeah. but you know if if climate change is the issue and climate change is why we want to go to mars you know why are we going to want to live in a boiling soup of an ocean that's not going to produce fish it's not going to produce the habitat we need it's not going to produce what we want as a species whereas we could go to mars it's not you know impacted by human involvement so i i guess i see that that if that's the train of thought which i couldn't tell you because that's a a billion miles away from what i deal with as a little shark biologist in my little part of the world you know that maybe that's why they want to go to mars if it's if it's if climate change is the big driving force of wanting to go to Mars, that's you know why they would want to go to Mars rather than living underneath the ocean. Yeah, and also I think yeah I think that living under the ocean just isn't sustainable at all. No. But um, so yeah, going back to you, so in turn, and then we'll get to the global warming, and then so where would you say that? the the highest kind of like density of sharks are like if i want to go out and take pictures of sharks or videos of sharks where would that be then also i think you already answered the question i was going to ask you but like you actually do go under the water with the sharks right i'm assuming you're in a cage when you do do this right no 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 i mean so are, are tiger sharks just not as are they the sharks that you got you have there in the the gulf of mexico are they just not as dangerous as the great whites you know, we, we, we talk a lot about, you know, you're, you're labeling <clears throat> certain animals as dangerous, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I keep going back to that. Sorry. But my point is, is that I don't think that the reason I asked the question is because I'm, I'm kind of like living in a world in California where it's like, you get the I don't think they're going to send, yeah, I don't think they're going to send somebody like you out with a shark without a cage just because it's great whites. Yeah. But with you, it sounds like you're living in a kind of like more of a world where it's like, you know, the the um tiger sharks just aren't as scary as some of the sharks we have here yeah um like i said that's a total different environment that i can't talk too much about if you want to talk yeah. more about like florida sharks you know if you want to see sharks uncaged you know and their beauty and they're peaceful they're, i mean sharks are so freaking beautiful if you can go out on a dive trip and see a shark you know not chummed you know, a lot of times these the dive operations are gonna chum the water to get sharks to come in. You know, that's just like ringing the dinner buffet. You know, they're they're gonna be riled up. They're gonna be a little more aggressive. You know, if you can get a good dive operation that's not gonna chum the water, that's not gonna do these things. You know, if you can just get a dive operation that says, "Hey, you know, sharks tend to be around this reef, or sharks tend to be around this area. Let's go out and swim and see where they are." You know, I've gone to jupiter and gone diving with sharks and man it's it's a whole different world when you know i'm just diving with a shark compared to when i'm tagging a shark you know they're 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 gonna be a little more violent when you're tagging them because you got a freaking hook in their mouth they're trying to get that out there you know they know they're being harassed um you know i used to tell people when they when they ask what do you do for a job i go 
well, I'm a professional shark stabber. You know, I do all this, 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 this. Um, you know, I, I don't think sharks are inherently dangerous. Just like, you know, you just have to have a respect for them. Am I going to go swim up yeah. to the I didn't, tiger I didn't shark? That, yeah, I didn't mean to ask that, to ask that question again. I was just more asking. I got on that again, but um, I understand. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What you're saying, you know what I mean? I mean, if you want to keep going, you can. I just didn't want to like make you think that I kept I'm keep asking the same question about how no, dangerous right, they right. are. Okay. Yeah. Um, as far as tourism, I recommend Jupiter, Florida. You know, great shark diving, great area. Um, you know, go, that's on the east coast of Florida. You know, Gulf Mexico. There's not really there's not any areas that are like oh you can go with this dive charter and get a shark dive and um um i mean it's just the luck of the draw just like with any wildlife viewing you know i could hire you to be my bear tour guide and you you see bears 95 percent of the time on this trail that we're going to walk and then one time we walk and there's no bears um as far as you know that that's what I would recommend. If you really want to see a shark uncaged, I would go to Jupiter, Florida. I like it there. It's a cool little area. And what kind of shark will you see there? I think you already said, but you know, so Jupiter, Florida is going to be more open ocean. Um, you know, you got your lemon sharks, which out of all the sharks I've tagged in my life, the lemon shark is the one that has got close to biting me. I can tell that story later. Um, you got lemon sharks, black tips. Um, I think those are the two I saw. I don't know what other ones they've seen. I can just speak to my personal experience. You know, lemon sharks, beautiful shark. You know, they kind of got the the bull shark coloration, but they got a little little more yellow in it. You know, there are a lot of there are a lot of the times in the keys, but they'll also kind of come up the coast a little bit into the Jupiter area. Beautiful shark. You know, they got a little more of that pronounced teeth. Um, that's a beautiful shark if you ever want to see it. Um, yeah, that and the black tip are the two ones I really saw on that trip. And that was, you know, super open ocean, you know, deep, deep water, blue as you could see, but you had just sharks kind of hanging out, swimming around. Super peaceful. And where you are, it's it is freshwater, right? And then if you go over to Jupiter Where I'm it's... at is saltwater. It's okay, a saltwater so it's, bay. So it's saltwater all over there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saltwater Bay. But in terms of like the world, would you say that there's other areas? Like, if you had to go anywhere in the world, like, where is, like, the ideal place for, like, a marine biologist to go see sharks? There's got to be a place better than Florida, oh, South right? Africa. South okay. Africa. You can see turtles, uh, great white sharks. You can see some I, – I worked my – so when I was undergrad, the master's student that was doing the uh, macroalgae sampling, he went to South Africa before he did his master's program, and he told me so many crazy stories – they were going out, you know, just swimming with great whites in the South Africa. It was crazy. You know, I, I, I didn't do it, so I couldn't talk too much about it. But, yeah, he, he was doing uncaged swimming around with great whites. And, I, I mean, I met I, he's a good friend of mine. He still has all his limbs, all his fingers. Never got anything nibbled off. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know they did that. that. That seems very dangerous to me. But, like you said, you guys are experts, so you know exactly how to handle the sharks. Yeah. And, you I know, wouldn't it, know what to do. It's the biggest thing is don't freak out. Yeah. You know? Same thing with same thing with bear. That's like exactly. the whole thing with any animal, right? Yep. It's just kind of like stay calm and not move or yeah, move very know, little maybe. With within my career I've had sea turtles, you know, multiple species of sea turtles, multiple species of sharks, and multiple uh species of fish. I've also tagged manatees and I've seen a manatee, you know, it was on its back. And when, when it was on its back, it just kind of shrimped and did this. And it hit the guy in the face and knocked out like five of his teeth. A manatee, the gentle di giants, you know, any wildlife you deal with could be. I've seen more people injured by manatees than I have sharks professionally. But, you know, I've swam, I've swam with a thousand manatees compared to sharks. You know, I've, I've been in a big herd of manatees. I wouldn't be in a big school of sharks. So, you know, it's, it's all situational, you know, what situations do you want to put yourself in? What situations do you feel safe in? You, you as a human have to make those decisions as a professional. 
Yeah, and speaking of which, if I like, let's just say I was in South Africa, and I'm like, hey, Joseph, I want, I want to go surfing out here, and it's like, you know, there's supposed to be like a ton of, you know, sharks or whatever. And I yeah. know people do go, I know people do go surfing yeah. out there, but there's one place I think called like Shark. Yeah, they got like Shark surfing. Beach. Yeah, it's yeah, a big it's tiger shark good, or some beach. Yeah, and it's supposed to be good surfing. Would you be like, no, I wouldn't go out there at all, or would you be like, you can go out, but be careful kind of thing you know what i mean yeah i mean i I, i'm gonna i'm a big film guy uh have you ever seen i I assume you're a surfer you've seen the endless summer yeah so you know how they went out and you know they're going to these beaches that's never been this is back in the 50s but they're going to these beaches that have never been surfed the first thing they did was they you know they talked to the locals you know if i'm going to a different country i'm gonna i'm gonna talk to the locals i'm gonna talk to people who go out there on a daily basis who go out there, you know, as part of their job, Hey, you know, am I going to go surf around these rocks or am I surfing around these rocks? You know, which, which rocks are holding the sharks at this time of year? You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go out and, you know, go to the local bar, get the couple surf guides, buy them a couple drinks and they're going to tell me everything they need to know. This is the best way I would do it if I'm going out somewhere. But yeah, I mean, talk to the locals, you know, feel out the vibe. And, you know, if you're not feeling comfortable, just don't go out that day. It's, it's, it's not, yeah. It's simple as that. Yeah. And yeah, like I said, I, I don't, I don't, um, I haven't surfed in a while, but one of my favorite things to do is, you know, like you were saying, some of these guys have the whole dome with the, with the camera inside, but I, I just have a GoPro or a DJI Osmo action camera. And, um, I go out there and film the waves or whatever. And man, it is, it is probably one of my favorite things to do because there's just something about being in the water with nature, like filming the waves or filming whatever the surfers or whatever. That's just so amazing. So I I would imagine that, you know, like when you said people wish they had your job, it's a cool job. So as far as the actual job, well, one thing I'm still a little unclear on is, what the end goal is that you guys are doing, like you're tagging the sharks and the turtles Mm -hmm. and what is the, you may have, you probably have already said it, but what is the, the goal for you guys when you're tagging the the sharks and the turtles? Just to kind of better understand predator prey relationships between, you know, your your predator sharks versus your sea turtles is a primary. So it's pretty simple. It's okay. Um, in terms of you going in, what what's it like going into the water with the sharks? Like, so you go out there on a boat, mm-hmm. I'm assuming, right? You, you jump off the boat. Are you, are you wearing the full scuba gear? No, so I I still do the volunteer work with Noah as a, a beach shark tagger. And so that 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 is a little more, you know, I'm in the water with a shark. So with that project, we set up on the beach. We have the big fishing reels. I mean, our reels are like this freaking big. Sometimes we're using like 250 pound test, you know, circle J hooks. They're as big as my jawbone. Um, and with that, you know, we're kayaking the bait out about 250 yards past the second sandbar. And that's where your shark population usually resides. Every area is different. I'm not saying if you don't go past the second sandbar, you're not going to see a shark. Um, so with that project, drop the bait, kayak back in, and we just sit around on the beach, you know, with, with that project, while I'm sitting on the beach, I'm doing reports, doing data management, doing, you know, Excel sheets, you know, I'm doing all my data management while I'm waiting for a shark. And just like in jaws, you start hearing that click and then that, that reel starts running and the rods bend over like that. And you're you're catching the shark and you're reeling it in, reeling it in, reeling it in. And then that's when I spring into action. I grab the line and I'm, you know, hand over fist, just walking myself, following the line to where the shark is. And then I locate the shark, you know, depending on what shark it is, you know, I play it different with every shark species wise, you know. So like if it's a hammerhead, a hammerhead can reach its head to its tail. So that's more dangerous for me because I'm the person grabbing it by the tail and trying to bring it on and do my sampling, my tagging and everything. 
So I have to be a little more cautious. You know, hammerhead and a lemon shark are going to be the two species that I'm the most careful around. A bull shark, you know, everyone says like, oh, that's the scariest shark. I can't believe you deal with them. Those things act like a freaking tank. You know, when I catch a bull shark, they are so exhausted. They're so tired after the process of catching them. You know, I'm grabbing it by its tail, depending on the size. You know, if it's too big for me to physically drag, I'm putting a tail rope on it and me and a buddy are dragging it up that way. Um, and then we're doing skin sampling and tagging GPS and acoustic and all that stuff. And that's with the nighttime survey. The daytime survey, we're doing everything from the boat. So we got one guy that has put a rope around the shark's tail, tied it up. You know, it's it's more stationary. We got another guy who's put uh, a water tube down the throat, keep water flowing through the gills. Got a third guy who's taking sampling and everything. All while we have another person who's our data manager that's taking, you know, we're screaming different numbers, you know, 13 and a half feet, X amount of weight, male, female, you know, three samples, you know, we're, we're screaming all this out to this poor data scientist that's trying to get everything in. And, uh, you know, usually I was the person who kind of dealt with the mouth end only because I had more experience than the rest of the group. And, you know, we're, we're de-hooking it. You know, I'm kind of watching over and, you know, making sure the health of the shark, you know, all this other uh, things with the health assessment. And then once we got everything, you know, we unhook it and, you know, we usually try and we'll, we'll move the boat a little bit just to make sure we get ample flow of water throwing, flowing through the grills to make sure it's nice and wide awake before we can release it. And it's healthy enough where we feel like it would have a fighting chance if, you know, a bigger shark came around and tried to mess with it. So that's a lot yeah. of information I just threw yeah. at you. You know, I do yeah, two it's different, a lot. It's, it can be a lot in a given uh, summer you know my summers are pretty busy I don't really have any time off is it mainly summer that you that you do it yeah so in the winter time you know we usually have a lot of your shark species are gonna go into that darker water the the deeper water we only have really like one species of shark that comes in during the winter time and it doesn't even uh, predate on sea turtles so we're not even doing shark tagging this time of year so it gives me an opportunity to catch up on uh, data management and we have other uh projects that aren't as saltwater intrusive you know we we deal with other you know terrestrial species and uplands projects yeah i know you guys have alligators and crocodiles there too in florida right have you had any yeah. experiences with those no i uh i i've been given the opportunity to work with that i i don't know i haven't I, I think I deal with enough toothy things. <laughs> I don't I don't need to deal with them in my free time. I uh I I'm kind of the turtle guy when it comes to the, the winter time. I do with the gopher tortoise surveys. Yeah. I like I like those guys. That's a lot of my time in the winter time is gopher torts. Yeah. So in terms of the actual tagging, what are you guys using to tag them? And also it seems extremely you're actually having to put the tag inside of like you're having to like literally stab it and put the tag in kind of like mm -hmm. inside the skin of the shark, mm -hmm. which seems like it would be incredibly hard. Right. Yeah. So, so what are you guys using for the tags and how does that process go? I can look to see if I have a tag in my house real quick. If you can give me like two minutes. It's up to you. I mean, if you can find I can it, explain quick, it. I can explain okay. it. So it's a, it's a dovetail piece of metal. It's like this and it's on an axis and then we have a metal rod connected to a wooden handle and the metal rod goes into the dovetail and then we literally just stab the dovetail in but since it's on the axis when it goes in you know it's still going to be on the axis so then that gps location system sticks out of the shark and the shark has to you know get within X amount of meters of the surface to relay the information back to satellites. And then we also have an acoustic tag we'd also put on it, which same system, dovetail, all that. It's a lot smaller, but we also had acoustic sensors within our work area that any animal 
that was acoustically tagged would ping off of our acoustic sensors and we would know about it. I mean, we had golf sturgeon coming in and we knew about it and we were able to assist other groups with their research projects. So those are the two uh, primarily tags that we used. Um, with sea turtles, we actually had a GoPro that we had put on them and it was attached with a little metal device that after I think like 48 hours would dissolve and the GoPro would float off of the sea turtle to the surface and we'd go out and find it and retrieve it and then review oh, that wow. footage. Yeah, that, that, would would be be pretty, that would be pretty cool for me to see that footage because I love that type of stuff, GoPro type stuff. Yeah. So yeah, you, you said you had a a story about um, you know getting attacked by the lemon shark. Do you have any stories you want to tell in terms of getting attacked? And then also in terms of this job, well, for one, are you working? Is it like a government agency you're working for, or is it, it's a gut? So you work for the government? Like uh, I'm a government contractor just because it's hard to get you know full time government positions. Um, I've worked you know as with nonprofits um, as far as that. Right now it's government. Um, you know, I've worked as a volunteer unpaid before all of this. You know, as an undergrad, I was, you know, working my butt off unpaid just to get experience to do this. You know, it's a lot of the the field is a little abused, in my opinion. You know, we, we have guys like me and gals and you know, people just like me that are passionate are willing to do stuff for free. And then, you know, it's not fair to people who have to work to survive you know it's it's totally not fair to the the people that have to work two three jobs just to pay rent you know i was lucky enough to get a job that i could work a nine to five and pay rent with you know th that that part of the field is frustrating as far as job prospects um as far as the the lemon shark i dealt with you know i it had every right to be pissed off i put a big big ass hook in its mouth um so we had, you know, super smooth lemon sharks. So they're, they're pretty hardy species. Brought on to the, this is a nighttime tag, so this is around you know one thirty, two o'clock in the morning, pitch black dark. We have one guy with a big spotlight that's kind of trying to keep it on me. Tag it, skin samples, do all the measurements and all that good stuff. And this is you know on the beach, pitch black night. You know, I, I put my left hand under its tail fin and then my right hand, you know, kind of just the tail fin goes over my shoulder and I have it just kind of held, and, you know, I'm just heave hoeing, you know, pu pulling the shark back into the water. And I think, I think it was a low tide that day. I'm heave hoeing and I, I get it back into the water, but the first sandbar was exposed still. And I realized I had to get it from the beach to the first sandbar and then over the first sandbar. So at one point, I've got the shark's, you know, tail fin over my shoulder and I'm like backstroking and just swimming back to the first sandbar. And it's, I mean, this shark must have had some like psychic, psychic sense. As soon as I put my first two feet down on that first sandbar, it knew it was like, no, 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 no. I'm done with you playing with me. You know, you're not going to mess with me anymore. And I'm heave hoeing it, heave hoeing it. And I'm just all my might. I'm just pushing this shark up onto the sandbar. And I'll tell you what, this, this job made me really get into like power lifting. I, I realized I had to be a lot stronger to <laughs> deal with these animals. These are some big boys. And I, I put it onto the sandbar and I mean, we might've had half a foot of water on that sandbar and I'm by myself. We had the guy on the beach just flashlighting me and the lemon shark just full twisted towards me and did a little chomp. And just the, the, the way the water was like perfectly at its lower jaw, the lower jaw was full of water. So when it chomped down, it like spat water at me. <laughs> so, you know, my initial response, I just kind of jerked it and like, tried to like swing it as far as I could towards that. And then it just kind of like wiggled its way off to the first sandbar and swam back into the deeper water. But that, oh that's gosh. like a, a gnarly thing. I like physically remember just watching this shark just 
I mean, a lemon shark, super flexible shark, crazy cool how it's evolved to be so flexible and like super cool shark, respect the hell out of it. It just totally turned around and looked me in the eyes and just went. And then it's like, not, just, not today, not today. And I said, I respect it. <laughs> I let go of it. It swam its opposite way. I swam the opposite way. And I said, I just remember I'm like swimming. I said, we're good. We're good. And just like threw my fingers up. And, you know, luckily it's like two in the morning and I'm like, Hey, yeah. You know, before we like reset our bait and everything, I'm going to take a walk. (laughs) And I had such an adrenaline high from that. I like walked like maybe like a quarter mile, just like far enough where people couldn't see me. I totally like yacked and threw up just from the adrenaline high from that. And I just threw up and I was like, Oh, I just like the worst, like just completely drained after that. And like, Luckily, we were done by like 2 a.m., so we didn't have anything else catch that day, but that's probably in a like way. <laughs> I mean, in a way, is it kind of like like after you don't die, basically? It's probably like in a way, it's kind of like a good experience, right? Yeah, I've heard you, like yes. I've heard like this sounds bad, but I've heard like psychopaths like like to put themselves in this. And I don't think that you're a psychopath, but they like to put themselves in situations where it's like they might die or like these crazy situations. And it's like, they say that they get like an adrenaline rush from it. No, no. I, I, uh, speaking of the adrenaline rush aspect, I blame my father 1000%. Uh, uh, it's, it's all his fault. He's a bomb guy. He diffuses bombs for a living. So I think it's just something genetically that I'm like, shit, I gotta do something that's like high intensity. (laughs) Yeah, you don't really look like that type of guy. Like, you look like a pretty mellow dude. Like, you don't look like some sort of, like, adrenaline junkie type. But so your dad is he – so he does kind of like the – um, what was that that famous movie about the, bo- the bomb? Hurt Locker. He does that type of stuff? He was a like cop the- doing that. Um, So he, he had a call out, like, once a week in the area that we were living in. But he's retired now. So he's a beach bum. He lives where I live. <laughs> Loves his I life. was thinking about this the other day where it's like – and I was going to ask you about your job, but which it sounds like I know the answer to, but it's like some of these jobs, like being a cop or going to the military or firemen, it's like, yeah, like you can go be a cop, fireman, military, and you can get paid okay and you can get good benefits, but you might die. Like, you know what I mean? It's like you might get shot or you, you might yeah. burn yeah. in the building. It's just like, no, thank you. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I mean, it's I was not uh... worth it. And same uh, with you, with your job. Like, oh, it's worth it. Is, oh, it's a thousand percent well, no. worth it. I'm not saying, well, for me, it wouldn't be worth it. But yeah, that's for fair. you, it is. <laughs> but with your job, like you potentially could die, mm-hmm. right? Like this isn't like obviously, but I mean, it almost sounds like this, like if that shark wanted to actually bite you. like oh, I'm done. You're done. You're, <laughs> you're done for so, I mean, I just, I, I can't, I, I'm kind of surprised they even have these jobs for one. I have so many questions about your story too. Why was it 2 a.m.? Like, I didn't know you actually were bringing these sharks on to land. So we try isn't and... that some, isn't that kind of like, how long do they have on land? Exa- to exactly. Breed? So, you know, we're keeping them in, you know, we keep where the, the surf is still supplying that oxygenated water to them. You know, the, the issue is, you know, for my master's, what I actually want to do is my thesis is looking at long-term impacts that bringing a shark onto land would have to its organs. That's what I would like to do for my math- master's thesis. We'll see if it I could be into bad it. for them. Exactly. Right? You know, yeah. but you know, I could screw out a lot of people out of jobs, you know, that's, you know, could be the issue, but that's something I'm super interested in focusing on my master's program that I'm going to start in the next couple of years. Um, as far as, you know, the adrenaline side, I never considered myself an adrenaline junkie. You know, yeah, I I joke about my dad doing what he did and everything. I say, I get it from him, but like, that's the only time I've ever really had like an adrenaline rush from it. Other than that, it's just super like, yeah, this is what we're doing today. Like, it's just another fish. It's just what we're doing you know not every shark's gonna clamp its jaws at you you know a lot of times they're just they just want the free meal and be left alone you know we give them the bait and they go home yeah yeah it sounds 
I mean, I have no clue. You know, I don't know your confidence level. Like in terms of, are you going to die today? Are you going to be bit? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know how dangerous. Only you can answer that because you've actually yeah. done it. I don't but, think you ever go into like, I never, I've never woken up in the morning and be like, I'm going to get bit by a shark or I've never really thought of it as that way. You know, you know, I, I and honestly, <laughs> this might sound crazy. My biggest anxiety from work is backing the stupid boat on the boat ramp. I freaking hate doing that. That's my hardest part of the job. Why? Have you ever, I, have you ever backed a boat into a boat ramp? Never. I've never even like driven a boat. Trailing a boat is like my biggest anxiety of the workday. Because one, I have, you know, big government agency labeling all over my truck and my boat and everything. So people think, oh, you're the expert. You know exactly what you're doing. So, so that that is my <laughs> as crazy as it sounds, like operating the boat, you know, trailering it and everything is my biggest like stressor of the day. Yeah, you know, it's interesting I- because yeah, I've had jobs where like just certain things will make you anxious and other things well and it doesn't really yeah. fully make sense but like like similar to that like i'm an amazon delivery driver but i drive like the the uh the blue vans you know that you see mm-hmm. but like i don't know how well i would drew, do driving in a semi truck because it's just like and it's like one of those things where you don't know until you try but i just wouldn't want to be in that situation where you're driving a semi truck and suddenly i have like a panic attack and it's like exactly you know you can't just be like oh, i'm I'm done. Like you, you got to keep driving. And it sounds like, you know, it sounds like I'm a pussy or whatever, but it's like even driving a semi truck kind of scares me. You know what I mean? Like there are tons oh, no, of jobs. I get it. Are scary. Yeah. I mean, just backing up my like pickup truck up to the boat hitch. I'm like ready to have a panic attack some days. Like, but you, you just don't want to hit on, anything. You don't want to hit. It's government property. I don't want to screw up. I don't want to cost more to our project. You know, if, you know, if I hit, if I screw something up on our boat, you know, that could be money that we're not going to have for tax. And that means less scientific research. We we're able to do that season. So I totally get it. You know, I have a lot of like, personally speaking, like super, super um, social anxiety, super bad about it, social anxiety. Like after work, I don't want to do anything, you know? Yeah. I, I, know I, what I you shut mean. down. Yeah. yeah. So I, I get that. It's just weird how like, the hardest part of my day is not the like physical handling of a shark. Like to me, that's like, that's the easiest part. It's just physical. Yeah. You can't screw yeah. up physical. As long as you're like in shape and know what you're doing, you can't screw up physical. Yeah. And yeah, similar with me, it's like one, like obviously I don't want to hit anything because that just sucks. Whenever you hit anything, it's just like a just total drag, you know? And then also like, but then there's other situations where like, I'll be out on, like my job isn't that dangerous, honestly. I know like tow truck driving can be because you're like you have to stop on the freeway. Mm-hmm. But where I'm stopping, and but it's I've been in situations where like I'll be on a on the side of like a busy street and I'll get out and I'm not really that worried about cars hitting me. Like, you know what I mean? It's like it's kind of messed up. But like the way I look at it is like like obviously I'm not trying to get hit by a car, but it's kind of like I guess if a car swerves and runs into me, then it's like I mean, I can't control that. And exactly. Um and not only that, but it's I just get out real quick, deliver the package, and go back. It's not that big of a deal, but certain things will be that probably should be more scary or less scary. But um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you have any other crazy stories, just in general, like kind of adre- adrenaline junkie stories. But if you do, go ahead. But I also want to just ask the question of some of this stuff does come across to me, you know, someone who knows nothing about it, basically. As you could, well, not even to me, but I guess people could look at what you do and be and same thing with tagging bears or tagging any animals as like, even though I think that you guys are ultimately and the government is ultimately trying to, to do good, it can kind of come across as like bad or like, in, like you having the shark, like beach, basically kind of sounds like you feel sorry for the shark. So do you guys feel like the, the long-term impact on these animals is overall kind of like is that how you kind of justify these things? Like it's going to be better for them in the long run? Yeah. Um, as far as like current methodologies, like obviously as a scientific community, we're constantly looking for less invasive, less problematic, you know, just how we as scientists can be better for these animals, how we can 
manage them better, how we can, you know, interact with them in a safer way on a day-to-day basis. You know, that's just what we do as scientists, what we try and accomplish. Um, but man, I, I, I run into that a lot, you know, would I love to like live in the Bahamas and, you know, do what they do on shark week while all I do is like swim up to the shark and put a little spear gun dart into them. Like, yeah, I would love to do that. But, you know, some days the water is going to get murky where I can't see two feet in front of me, you know, as, as, as a, as someone who needs to get that data consistently, that's not viable for me, you know, we might be impacting a small, 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 small subsection of the population. You know, it it, it is that greater, the, the, does the greater good outweigh what we're impacting? Um, you know, I, I would love to see new methodologies come into how we work. You know, we've tried to use drones to do population surveys. We've successfully done a couple of surveys with drones, you know, you know, dr- drones could be the next big uh, tool. You know, it is the next big tool that we use as scientists. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to be able to fly a drone and tag a shark with it. So, you know, some days it would be nice to, like, be totally non-invasive with animals. But it, it it's it's not the reality as we see it so far with the current technology that we possess. Yeah, and it goes back to like what we were saying before about um I uh, I lost my train of thought there. Um <laughs> we were talking about this type of thing before where it's like is yeah, I guess it's just is it is it overall better for the animal or not? Yeah. Exactly. You know, that's yeah. and the, you know, that's kind of why I want to go to ma- get my master's degree is so I can, you know, see if we're having those impacts so yeah and i think what i was what i was going with was like the delicate balance too of not only is it better for the animal but we also want to do what's best for us right like it's like yeah so you know there are certain there are certain situations where like you just have to do bad i guess to do good you know like you have like obviously if you're in a situation where there's like too many animals, you can't just let them run wild. You got to kill some of them, I guess, yeah. you know, which is sad. It's a sad truth, but. And that's, you know, I know this sounds crazy. And I've said this many times today because that's just a whole different part of this field. There, there are people who their whole job is dedicated to fisheries management who we, you know, we send our, you know, population survey data, we're going to set, we're going to transfer that to different people within our agency who deal with fisheries management. You know, they know if there's X amount of sharks in this area, then, you know, the snapper population is going to react in this certain way. And then with the snapper population in this uh, foreseeable future, then we can have this much commercial fishing going on in the area, you know? So that's like a whole different, subsection of my job you know I, i'm more of a researcher where that is more of a managerial <clears throat> role um, i can say you know i would like to get there eventually that's kind of where i want to move my career towards is fisheries management i think it's super cool what they're doing you know it, it gives the biggest impact you know with public and everything i think it's super cool what they're doing yeah so in terms of the good of what i think you kind of just mentioned it but in terms of the good of what you're doing from just like from your perspective is it kind of like if we get enough information on these these animals we're going to ultimately make a better decision such as like you said like where they allow fishing and stuff like that or like what are some of the other examples of you know good changes we can do exactly you know if we understand how these species work together on a long-term basis, you know, we can maybe increase fishing populations or decrease fishing populations. So first future generations can also eat the fish that we're currently eating. Um, you know, it, it is all for the management of future generations right now. You have to kind of see past the here and now. Um, I would love to see 
a possibility where my future generations can see the sharks that I'm working with. I don't want them to go extinct, even though we are in the third largest extinction event in human history or in the earth's history. Um, you know, that, that is the, the issue that we struggle with as scientists is, you know, trying to explain these complex and diverse issues with the general public. And I do think that we have kind of lost that as an art and, you know, I'm really working hard to try and get a better or a better public relations with science and especially with fisheries management and, you know, research on shark populations and shark research in general. And the third largest extinction event would be, would that be global warming or? Just what we're in currently. We're currently in it. What, what, I mean, what would be the cause of it though? Like the possibility of um, oh, yeah. a nuclear it's, it's, bomb? It's, 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 glo- it's global everything? warming. You know, global warming is displacing so many different species from their native environments. We're seeing, you know, as the seas temperature increases, we're, we're seeing different reactions you know coral bleaching um fish populations moving more southerly you know we're having these crazy shifts of populations distributions and just general and that's just from a wildlife issue you know we could start seeing you know climate change refugees which you know that's a whole different topic i have no knowledge on but you know, as sea levels rise and everything, we're going to have refugees that, that their village and their houses and everything have been just flooded away. Um, but if, as far as wildlife standpoint, you know, we are c- currently seeing, you know, populations of fish have to move. Populations of coral is bleaching and dying. And, you know, it, it it's annoying for us as fisheries and, you know, the marine biology community as a whole, because we've been tooting this horn since the early 80s, but everyone's been kind of dismissing us. So it's, yeah. it's nice to get a little bit of feedback and ears open to us and what we're saying. No, and that's definitely why I, or I definitely agree with you on that subject. And I think the big problem, if you're, I think you're mainly just talking about global warming, right? Yeah, global or, warming, tra- climate change, you know, they're going to be used yeah. interactively and yeah, vice versa. So, so the, I think the, the big thing with that is, well, first of all, you, you probably have half of the country who just doesn't believe in it for whatever reason. And then I f- the only problem that I have personally, I don't feel like there's enough specific data in terms of like when is one, when's it going to happen? And I know you could probably just say no one can predict when, but I think mm-hmm. that humans are kind of like tend to be like, well, if it doesn't affect me in the next, which is sad to think about, but like we were saying before, you want to look to future generations, obviously your kids and their kids. But I think most people sadly think if it doesn't happen with the next, I don't know, 50 years or whatever, then it's just not going to bother me. Keep giving me my Amazon package or whatever it is. And to be honest with you, I don't even know how much Amazon is involved. I don't know how much anything is involved with anything. So it's like, for one, do, are we actually, are we as humans in impacting the earth in a negative way? Yes, I would assume. And then two, when is it going to happen? How long do we got before we really got to like start, you know, taking this seriously. And then, but that's a big question. The first one is a big question that a lot of the people ask is like, are we going to even be able to change it? Yeah. Right. And do you think that we will be able to? Oof. And then also, if you can answer when, when do you think, like, when do you think it's going to get to the point? I live in California. Mm-hmm. When do you think it's going to get to a point where the water actually is rising enough to where those houses on the coast literally can't be there? Yeah. Anymore. Um you know, we both live on coastal states. Um I, I I think the problem with climate change is the it's it's the antidote about if you throw a frog in hot water, it's not gonna realize it's in hot water until it dies. And you know, you constantly just slowly, slowly get that water a little hotter and a little hotter and a little hotter until it's done. And I think that is, as a human population, that is what we are in 
as a situation as a whole, as far as, you know, I, I don't think, you know, this is, I, I keep saying this because it is the truth, you know, this is a whole different side of science that I'm not really well versed in, but from my personal understanding is, I think what's going to be the more immediate impact is these insane weather events. You know, I went through a Category 5 hurricane recently. I never want to go through that again. But guess what? It could become an, a yearly event in our state. You know, it is going to become a yearly event. You know, these extreme weather patterns, we had a, a massive earthquake within the last week. The world, you know, these, you know, that's not weather dependent. Um, it's just these extreme weather events we're going to see that are like, once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime, you just keep hearing that. Well, we're going to see that a whole lot more than once in a lifetime. Yeah, you know, I think that's going to be the the quick alarm for people. And maybe that might wake some people up and might make people realize what's going on. Um, I couldn't give you like an exact timeline for when I think my house is going to be underwater or anything like that. Um it's 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 the the alarm bell has been ring, ringing since the early 80s you know we we were able to help with the ozone layer during that aspect so I, I i do think if we look at that as management practices it gives hope to the future um i think that's why i kind of get annoyed with these billionaires that are uh you know cutting and running and going to mars when you know, what I do, you know, we could use an extra couple thousand dollars to get better equipment or better tagging, you know, to better understand, you know, what these impacts are having on populations. Um, yeah, I don't think I could give an exact, like, I, I'm not going to give, like, set your calendars to 2042, you're, you got to be uh, underwater by then. Yeah, and... I don't know. I mean, well, like you said, with the with the strange weather patterns, it's what's weird about Southern California is. Um, so like like so before like December, it was like you know, um, really dry, and they were saying that it's a um, we're in a drought or whatever. But then come December or January, maybe it was, we had like a, a good storm over like five days. It was like a ton of water over five mm -hmm. days and snow. And then they were kind of like, Oh, well, the water has like refreshed the, not like necessarily we're fine now, but we're kind of like better off now. But what's weird about it is, I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain, but it, it seems like it's going more of drastic kind of random weather patterns. Like it goes from being like really kind of like hot and dry then suddenly like cold and wet and there's snow up in the mountains, but then now it's back to being hot and dry immediately. Yeah. It's like, what the hell? Like, you know what I mean? Like I thought we were at least going to have like a winter of rain. And now it seems like it's just done. It could have been a week and that's it. Yeah. Uh, I just want to, you know, preface, you know, I'm not a climatologist. I took like maybe two classes on this subject in college. Um, so to, to define what weather is weather is our our day to day our week to week you know it i look out the window it's raining right now that's weather the, the climate is a 30 year period of that what is going on as an average in that area due to of its weather what's the average of the weather in that area over the long term so you know we can use that data over a long period of time and you know we can make predictions we can make assumptions but just like your local weatherman you know those assumptions can be wrong and people question us like well how do you know what happened during the dinosaur age you know how do you know what happened in the ice age when so we, we go into the arctic you know and i say we you know I'm, this isn't even my field of study so could be completely wrong i'm just saying what i understand we we the, the scientists go into the arctic and when snow falls you know and it hits the surface it's going to trap an air bubble and then they take ice core samples of those air bubbles 
And based on the depth of that ice, you can extrapolate how far back in time that was. So based on these little bubbles that were captured by falling snow in the Arctic back way, way, way back, we can measure the amount of CO2 that is dissolved in the air. So that's how, as scientists, we can, we can understand data that's gone back way, way, way back. And like I said, that's a whole different, you know, that's a whole different field of study than what I'm knowledgeable of. But that is what my knowledge has consisted of is that. So that's kind of how I explain what we do is, you know, climate change and how we understand climate change in the here and now. Could that change in the next 10 years? Of course, science is constantly changing. Science is constantly improving. And, you know, for people, that is hard to understand. We are constantly challenging each other as scientists. We're constantly saying, hey, you're wrong. This is why you're wrong. You need to change. And then I need to go out, get the data, get the samples, and get everything and go say, hey, you're actually wrong for calling me wrong. And here's the information to explain why I'm right. So that's, you know, as scientists, it's a constant battle back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, with an issue as big as climate change and it being on a public stage, it makes us look bad as we're going back and forth, back and forth. You know, it makes people distrust us in the long run. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I mean, it was the same thing with with COVID, I think, where it was like they would say one thing and then they would change it. And I get why, because this is a new yeah, virus or whatever. That field of study is. Yeah, oh, that's I couldn't like, imagine. And I think about that all the time. We're like, they're getting so much, so much shit from people. I mean, Fau- Fauci is probably, or he is just getting death letters. Oh, I'm sure. And it's like, I, th- I ultimately want to think that they did the best they could. And yeah, he did the best they could. I mean, I kind of like look at, I know I could be like, uh, you know, ignorantly, you know, ignorant about this, but I, I kind of like look at what they did in the government in general, what you're doing. I kind of like tend to be like, okay, well, you're trying to do good ultimately. Like, you know, you yeah. know, in your field at least that you're trying to do good. They're not like trying to do bad, but I kind of ultimately believe them. And to a certain extent, for a government to work, you kind of just do have to trust them. Like, if, if you're, I feel like if you're in a government that you don't trust and you think there's kind of like maniacal things going on, like the vaccine is going to kill you or whatever it might be time to get out, right? I mean, but it's like, if you can't even trust your government, the people you're giving your tax dollars to to do the right thing, you think they're doing the wrong thing, it's probably time to go out and then get out. And then the question is, where do you go? Because how many governments <laughs> are actually, Yeah, I know there are some really bad governments out there. So um, it's, I think it's a hard thing to do in general. And you kind of mentioned debating or talking with people about it. Do you do that? Like, are you somebody who like goes on Reddit or whatever and will kind of like, or maybe not Reddit, but like, I don't know where you do it. You do it face to face with people or. Yeah. If you know, I, I can't go to the boat ramp without people questioning what I'm doing. Cause I'm a government agency. I have government letters on my truck. I have, you know, Oh, a shirt saying I'm with the government. People are going to be constantly <laughs> questioning what I'm doing. Um, Especially you know, in I, Florida, probably right, right. Especially in Florida, <laughs> I have my little business card. I have my phone that's constantly ringing. Um, you know, I, I, and I and I think it, it it's it's hard <clears throat> right now. You know, I definitely think there is that distress of science from COVID, rightfully so. I I get where people are coming from. People who are not in the scientific community who don't understand the scientific process past, you know, their eighth grade education. I'm not dissing anyone for it. Guess what? I'm not going to go out and repair my truck's engine in the next 10 minutes. People have their, their specialties and what they're smart at. I'm not dissing anyone for not being versed in every exact thing, but I do, I do get where the distress of the government comes from, where the distress of the scientific community comes from in general. So, you know, I try to approach it as, you know, I'm not superior than you. I'm a good old boy. I just went to college because I'm interested in fish. <laughs> like, that's what it is. At the end of the day, I just like fish. I'm not that special. Like, <laughs> guess what? There's probably people that know a thousand times more than I do about this, about all these topics, but. I think I have like, you know, a charisma, uh, a, a certain way of describing and, you know, 
I can tell fun stories about catching fish and I can inspire people about, you know, doing what I do and, and improving the environment. You know, if, if, if I talk to a thousand people and one person says, Hey, you know, maybe I want to tell my kids they should be marine biologists or at least look into marine biology. You know, that's a win for me. Um, as far as public outreach, I'm super into short film. Um, I've developed two short films myself to do for public presentations because I don't like speaking in front of a, a crowd of 100 plus people. I think it's boring. If I can make a fun educational short film that's funny, you know, hits the right market, hits the right people, and that can eat up 30 minutes of my presentation, I want to do that in a heartbeat, you know. I think as scientists, we need to look at different ways we can approach public. You know, I'm, I would love to, in, in the near future, after I get my master's to start my own nonprofit where I don't have as many restrictions as I do as being a government employee, you know, I would love to do different, you know, multimedia projects and, you know, be able to talk a little bit more about exactly what I do. Um, to like a, a, a podcasting form or, you know, YouTube or, you know, I'd be down to Twitch stream, have the old a phone on the boat while we're tagging sharks. You know, how, how amazing would that be for the general public to, you know, actually watch what we do as scientists on a day-to-day -day basis. If we get two viewers that day, that's, you know, two people we impacted, you know, would that be legal? Like, could um, you actually film what you're doing as you're doing it? I don't think so. It's, it's a lot of what we do, you know, it is government. So, you know, th there's so much oversight with the government before anything. That's why I haven't mentioned like specific government agency I work with or who I'm affiliated with. Cause if I were to, you know, I would have to go through all the way up to DC and get everything I said um, approved before it can be released. Um, you know, that's why I want to go, you know, more towards a nonprofit role. You know, I want to get, a nonprofit started where I invite people who are in their undergrad, who, you know, just out of high school and I take them out on boats and I, you know, kind of show them what it's like to be a Marine biologist for a day. You know, it's not just going out and catching sharks and doing all this crazy stuff, you know, for every minute I'm out in the field doing shark tagging, that's an hour of Excel spreadsheets. I'm looking through data i'm monitoring you know it's it's so much office work after the fact you know it's it's definitely a, that balance i don't think a lot of people realize you know we're not just filming for shark week every weekend you know it's a lot of office work it's a lot of data management you know i, I have to you know do different scripting you know i'm working in gis a lot of computer programs it's a you kind of have to be versed in a little bit of everything nowadays yeah and in terms of the filming are you doing like kind of like documentary type stuff? And then are, are you also like directing and act, are you actually filming yourself? I, I call it mockumentaries. Um, I started in college, my uh, freshman year of college. Similar like, similar like The Office or something kind of. Exactly. So my, yeah. my first mockumentary was on Jaws. And I was playing a scientist in a lab coat and I was convinced that all sharks were man eaters. And I went out to the beach in swim trunks and a full lab coat and i interviewed all these random people on the beach got them to like oh what do you think about sharks what do you think about sharks and it's just a whole all these different little scenes came together and made this little you know 30 minute documentary i made for school and then i made another one recently on a shark week and i played a scientist that was like searching for where all the sharks go after shark week because shark sharks just exist to be these media celebrities during shark week and that was kind of my pitch um but yeah i mean i write the scripts myself i direct them myself i get my poor little girlfriend to shoot me running around in lab coats and all this stuff on the beach or in the ocean or you know so it's kind of woods. like what's that called like um in real time kind of like boots on the ground type thing where like yeah. you literally are just going up to people and you're and they're filming you talking yeah. to people on the beach no i i obviously walk up i have a little nd or not nda um public release forms and you know i was like hey you know this is all i do stuff personally not with the government this is kind of my yeah. side projects you know, i give them the forms they release all that and then i kind of you know hey you know i'm filming something on shark conservation you know what do you think about sharks i have a little discourse with them beforehand and then you know i start talking to one person 
and especially on the beach, this is, who's this like white pasty boy in a lab coat <laughs> standing around on the beach? People start, you know, noticing you and they, they come up to you and, you know, you know, some guys like he just totally, like, we did like a whole improv scene of like 15 minutes long. And he was like, Oh yeah, I'm a surfer. Every time I go out surfing, I have to give a shark a finger. And like, he, we just had like a good improv that went, it was really well done. Um, is it up on YouTube? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's up. On, um, I don't think it is anymore. I'll have to look actually. What kind of camera are you using for this stuff? So in college, I used my iPhone. Um, with the last one I did, I did a Canon 60 iPhone for camera two and then GoPro for any action shots. Um, on the next, I'm trying to do more, um, not just like, sciencey stuff i have like four or five scripts i've written um they're like drama or whatever crap you want to call it and then i have a docuseries i'm working on currently and i recently purchased a the black magic pocket cinema 4k highly recommend that camera to anyone it's a good one right oh it's great anyone that wants to start in film you know it doesn't have autofocus doesn't have auto white balance you have to learn all the the aspects of film beforehand you know i think that's you know i didn't take any film classes in college anytime i was i had free time with my classes i went on youtube i did like film composition i just watched all these as much youtube as i could to learn film and composition and you know how to edit stuff what cameras to use like how to do certain things you know if i do a a wide angle focus on this scene what kind of like what will it convey to an audience you know I tried to learn that stuff along with my marine biology, which is a pretty big workload. Yeah. So the, the black magic camera, well, first of all, how much is it? Um, you can get like just the body, um, no lenses for under 850. You can get it fully kitted out with, you know, lenses, you know, external monitor, external battery. So the problem with the camera is really bad battery life. You get extra batteries and you can get like a camera that is ready to just pick up and shoot for like 1500. Um, I would all recommend trying to get like a external rack focus as well. But you were saying that um, there's no auto stabilization or auto no. um, autofocus. So like you have to, so how are you stabilizing it? Do you literally have like a stabilizer or I'm usually using a tripod. Um, it's a lot of like interview focus stuff i'm doing right now i'm working on a it's a docuseries called for the love of and i'm following people who like everyone has their like niche you know mine's sharks my my roommate in college he's in a band so i'm doing for the love of music so i'm following his band um you know going to their uh practices and everything and the whole you know docu or this whole documentary thing is like leading up to them playing a gig they're a super small band. They don't play a lot of gigs, you know. You know, it's all leading up to them playing this big gig at this bar or whatever, wherever their next gig is at. And so it's kind of that. Um, you know, I want to do one with my father and how he like blows shit up for his job. Um, you know, stuff like that. So for the love of is kind of what I'm working on now. Me and that roommate that uh has the band, we just started a podcast that's pretty casual. So a lot less science focused. So if I bored everyone with the science, there's a different <laughs> way you can listen to me. Yeah. What's it called? Uh, it's called low Seltz esteem. So me and him uh, review different seltzers because in college we were big seltzer boys. We drank all the different seltzers and there's been like a revival of seltzers and all these crappy seltzer flavors. So we think it's pretty hilarious and we kind of review all the crap ones. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm into, I'm into, I wouldn't even call it film. I would call it like, um, posting reels on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. Yep. I mean, I feel like I'm pretty good at it, but I, the main problem is I, and I don't really want to get too into the weeds with this stuff, but, um, the main problem is, is that like, I just don't have the money for like really nice equipment. So I have my iPhone, which honestly, as you probably know, is pretty good. And then I have a DJI Mavic Mini drone, which is relatively cheap for drones. Mm -hmm. I want to get the Mavic 3, which is like two or $3,000, but I have to go with the $500 one. 
And then I do have a DSLR, but the DSLR isn't great. Um, but what's funny, what's so great about it is that like cameras are so good on the iPhone and everything else. They're so cheap nowadays that I can post decent quality on there. My goal is to eventually, you know, um, make money off of it. I'm getting a little bit of money on Instagram, but I want my goal right now is to get monetized on YouTube. And that is very hard to get monetized on YouTube. And one of the things that I'm finding is very hard to find exactly. I want to start doing videos like this, but like when I'm not doing the podcast, I also do like my own videos. It's very hard to get myself to do it by myself. And then also, yeah. So just finding kind of like what to do is hard before I was just posting my drone videos and any type of iPhone videos I was taking and just didn't the drone videos didn't seem to do as good as I thought it would do partially because I don't have the best drone. Um, and then recently during that storm that I feel like we're going off on a tangent here, but during that storm that I mentioned, I wanted to bring my drone up and like film the snow and the clouds going Ooh, over yeah. the snow on the mountains. It's, it's in my opinion, the best footage I can possibly get is yeah, like in the clouds in the mountains with the snow. And now the snow is almost not even there anymore. And my drone's broken. It's literally getting fixed. So I kind of like miss, I got some of that opportunity and I missed some of it, but anyways, yeah. So I got to wrap it up so soon. Unfortunately, I think you probably do too. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm five. pretty open. This is like my one off day. So. Yeah. Oh, it worked out well. And I'm kind of out of it today. I don't think, you know, I didn't really expect to do this, which is fine, but I'm, more tired i think it's like this weird weather that's honestly like yeah affecting. i mean it just started raining while we did it. we were doing the podcast <laughs> I, i'm watching the rain come in over the lake yeah so bringing it back to um i kind of wanted to go over the politics really quickly and maybe a little bit of the global warming stuff if you have any more knowledge but mm -hmm. in terms of the politics that's going on in florida i know like a lot of stuff is going on like with ron DeSantis and stuff yeah like are things I've heard from a lot of people through the podcast too, that things aren't like going well. And I think that I live in like somewhat of an insular bubble in Southern California where it's, I don't live in LA, which is like extreme left, which is yeah fine. I live kind of in the Inland empire. I don't really get a whole lot of like chaos going on, but I've talked to a lot of people who have mentioned that things just aren't good where they're living and, everything's going to shit. I feel like everyone's always saying things are just going to shit. Like with, so yeah. How, how do you look at the whole political landscape, especially being in Florida with Ron DeSantis and all that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, politic wise. I mean, <laughs> as, as an environmental scientist that there's a whole party who thinks I'm a, a hack because I say the uh... word climate change, you know, and, and it's like fresh. literally, literally you, they literally think you're a hack. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Where? Like online on YouTube or. Oh like yeah. Like... You know, I, I, I was going through reels the other day and it was this guy just like fishing off the coast of Florida. And it was just a video of a shark swimming around his boat. And he said, kill them all. And he, and you go through these, I wish I had it saved. Cause I could just send it to you. All these comments are like, yeah, these biologists don't know what they're talking about. There's too many sharks in the water. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, it's not even, it's a black tip shark. So imagine you walk out to like your Walmart parking lot and see seagulls and you're like, Oh, I see this X amount of birds. So we don't need to protect owls or whatever endangered species is in California. Just because I saw some seagulls in a parking lot in Walmart, like the, the politics of it, you know, I, I, it's hard to talk about it because you know, as a scientist, I try to be as apolitical as possible. Um, you know, I never really consider myself left or right or whatever, you know, it, it is frustrating. Um, I definitely remove myself from politics as much as I can because I got plenty else to stress about, like with my day to day to work and, you know, everything yeah. like that, you know, but, you know, also, you know, I worked under the Trump administration. I worked under the Biden administration, you know, funding was different under Trump funding was different under Biden. Um, you know, I, I, I work with people who work for Florida wildlife department. Um, and they say Ron DeSantis is actually pretty wildlife forward. 
you know, but he's also anti-climate change. So there's that weird, it's weird. You know, I don't know how to explain it other than weird. <laughs> the politic climate of America is just weird. And it's just very weird. It's weird for me. I grew up, my first my first election was the Trump-Hillary election. And then my next election was you know, Trump-Biden. It's just been a weird political time in America. Man, I, I, I hope for the day that, you know, all we care about is who wins the next Super Bowl <laughs> rather than what goes on with the House and the Senate and who boos who at the State of the Union address. Like, man, it's it's weird. It's it's weird right now to get yeah. into politics. Speaking of weird, I, I listened to, the, I don't know if you heard of this podcast called H3, the H3 podcast with the Ethan oh, Klein. You know what I'm no, talking about? The Vape Nation. I was a big Vape Nation guy growing up. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I didn't, I, ha- I didn't go back. I've heard that he was better like back in the day. I, I didn't, uh, I haven't gone. How old are you, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? Or like uh, rough I'll age. be 26 this year. Okay. I'm a young so, guy. I'm so definitely you're, yeah, one of the youngers. <laughs> you're younger. Yeah. So um, I recently got in to that podcast but it's mostly him and you know hassan piker who goes oh, on yeah. his show yeah, yeah. so you watch the leftovers have, exactly it's leftovers i pretty much have only been listening to leftovers but they went into this thing on ron DeSantis where he was saying he was literally like something with like gas oh stoves my god versus electric so it, ron like, DeSantis. It, doesn't, it, it, doesn't, oh. it didn't make any sense he's like they're it's, coming after they're coming after our was it gas stoves or yeah but but i think it's like it was so weird 93 percent of florida population uses electric so three percent of the population has a gas stove and he's like yelling about three percent of our population Uh, yeah i i I watch leftovers a lot i watch hassan piker a lot actually he's where i get you know mostly my left-leaning you know my hard left-leaning i try and watch you know both sides but man it's hard to watch the right side sometimes um you know, I don't watch a lot of politics. I'm pretty familiar with Hassan. You know, he's controversial in his aspects, just like with any political commentator nowadays. Um, you you kind of have to be like yeah. in this climate. You can't just you be like down in the middle or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially if that's like if you're gonna make a career like I am a political commentator, you have to pick a side nowadays. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was weird. That you know. My parents are pretty, you know, hard. Did you say, did you say you have to, if you had to pick a side like you are, are you? I, I mean, side? If, if I had to like, you know, stand up, like Joseph says, left side is the right side. I, I guess I would say left just because. No, but I mean, I'm more was wondering, are you, do you actually like speak on YouTube on this type of stuff? Because okay. you also mentioned that people were calling you a hack. I was just wondering if you're actually. Yeah. I just called a hack because I'm a scientist. Oh, so anybody who's a scientist is a hack. Okay. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, the political spectrum, I stay far away from. I just, yeah. I like going fishing. I like fish. I'm a shark guy. Yeah. You know, um, if somebody bothers you, just be like, hey, I, I'm just going fishing. Like, <laughs> leave me alone. Like, oh, you know. for sure. You know, I usually, <laughs> if someone's like, I, I don't think I've actually, on the, on the job site, I've never had, anyone say political things i've worked a job i worked a job as an invasive plant biologist and you know the, we were spraying you know spraying pesticide to control invasive plants and that's controversial in its own right and i could i could come on to a whole nother episode and talk about that but you know that was more political people you know spraying like, plants mm-hmm. is political oh yeah because people are super <laughs> against it everything yeah. is man Everything, yeah. yeah. I mean, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I sat down and the guy was telling you, go get rid of the sea turtles. I can't catch any fish. And I remember I was holding, you know, I just got done capturing a, a loggerhead sea turtle and it was like sitting at my knees. And I remember looking down at the sea turtle. I'm like, if you hate sea turtles, then no matter what I do as a scientist, someone's going to hate. So I might as well do something I like. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as far as the politics, you know, Florida's weird. I just go back to politics being weird, you know. Yeah. That whole gas stove issue made no sense to me. You know, we have plenty of other things that we need to be freaking out about. And so. I don't even know like what it was over because I didn't know that was an issue at all. So some people who have gas stoves essentially just want to keep their gas stoves. They don't want to have to switch. And so I yep. guess like what he's saying is that liberals are kind of like trying to make people switch. Is that what's yep. going on? Yeah. Well, like I said, I okay. think it's like 93% of the state of Florida has electric stove. So 
It doesn't even matter anyways, right? Why is it a big deal? Why like of all the of all the things we could be arguing over, why gas stoves? Yeah. And electric stoves is the reason is that because like they're just better for the environment or better for the house or they're better for the environment, I believe. Um, you know, I you're not putting fumes in the air like you would with a gas stove if you accidentally leave it on. Yeah. Um I honestly know so little about the whole well, I guess climate change environmentalism even like i know like tesla cars are good because they're electric and mm-hmm. ford f-150s are bad but like i don't really know but the, why so, exactly i mean i do know why yeah. but it's just, I, I don't know enough to like really like comment on it you know especially the stove situation <laughs> but so the stove situation is a weird one i'll say that <laughs> yeah funny but how how do you just to speed things up? How 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 do you see things going in the in the future election? What do you if you had to guess? What do you think is going to happen? Like, it's basically Trump versus DeSantis, and then yeah. versus um, who do you think will be on the on the on the left? Do you think Biden's going to go again, or Kamala Harris, or like? I don't think either. But ah, man, it's weird. I hate saying who, that. Who's over the and other over. person that that would go for the left? I don't even know if it's not. I don't either. either. Yeah, maybe only. I don't see Biden wanting to rerun. I don't know. He he had a good State of the Union, I believe. Um, I I think what's more interesting is the Republican Party, and we're gonna ha- we're gonna see a massive split this year between the Trump Party and the DeSantis. Which is good. I believe. Kind of right. I think I it's kind of good. There's a split them up. I think Trump has like changed politics so drastically. And this is yeah. coming from a, a 25 year old who barely knows anything about politics. <laughs> I'll preface yeah. that. Yeah. I don't, I really don't know how this uh, cycle will go. Um, all I do know is in the next four years, I'm still going to go out fish. I'm still going to go out and tag my sharks. I'm still going to do what I love. <laughs> yeah. You'll still be doing the same stuff probably in four yeah. years. Um, but in terms of those two, who do you who do you think is going to win? If you had to pick, who who would you pick to win out of those two? DeSantis. Oh, really? So you think he's even better than Trump? Okay. I think Trump lost a lot of credibility. I think uh, he flopped with those NFT stuff. He did that NFT stump, and that pretty flopped. Oh, what else did he do? I, I, I well, I saying think, the saying the election was rigged, probably. Yeah, right. I, I think yeah. the whole January sixth situation is gonna tarnish it i think i think desantis is more palatable to the general public i think that's the only reason i would give him the edge yeah so i don't know that that that's a weird one with me because what i've heard well i don't like either of them but from what i've heard about both of them or from from DeSantis has been like him like him taking the immigrants and and bringing them. That to, was um, so bad. That was insane, man. But the whole thing how. is like back to the whole polarization. I think these people know what they're doing, and they're I think they're intentionally trying to be as extreme as possible because they know they have to get the gnarliest fan base. Yeah, they're you just have to look at them as uh, entertainers at this point. Both sides. <laughs> Both sides are entertainers. Both sides are playing to their fan base. <laughs> you know, it's you, become a game. Yeah, it, it is a game. It's just, you know, I don't know. It, it, it is just it's entertainment at this point, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of the the um, really, I'm trying to cover all the topics, but so in terms of the intellectual dark web, have you heard of? Have you heard of these guys, the intellectual dark web? It's a weird term. For that's that, that's a new one for me. Okay, so to quickly go over it, it's basically like Jordan, you know Jordan Peterson, obviously, right? He's like the skinny white guy. Yeah, the older guy. There's Ben Shapiro. There's Steve oh, Crowder. Yes. There's yeah, Joe okay. Rogan. There's yeah. Dave Rubin. In terms of these types of guys, do you – I was just going to ask you like a blanket question of what do you think of these types – but then there's also, I think these guys are just doing the exact same thing. And like you said, the left too, that the politicians are doing, which is like they're picking a side and they're just going with it. So I was kind of like wondering real quick. I know it's a, it's an extremely hard thing to go over quickly, but it's also kind of like when you see other people doing this type of grift, you almost kind of wonder like, 
like could I? I I don't think that I could but it's like I, I'm not even saying that I want to be a griff because I would like literally just be taking the left side and just but like go hard with it yeah and it's uh, uh, bringing it back to the YouTube thing it's like if if I can make a career on YouTube doing anything I would want to do that and so and you said that you also do film stuff too so I mean yeah I, I feel mean, like my question has gotten kind of weird here with this but like um what do you think of those types of guys like you took the word out of my mouth when you said grift i mean they're grifters. yeah yeah I, I think and i hate to say this about them i think they're smart people i think they're they are, that's, that's what's weird is they are smart people yeah i think they're businessmen they know what's going to sell they know what's going to do well they're business people they know what they're doing um i think any political content right now is going to do well i think that's such a divided uh atmosphere that we're in as an american pol as Mer as far as like american politics is so divided it's gonna do well it's it, it's just heat there's heat around it is the best way i could it's hot and the best way yeah. I can, they're they're just taking advantage of it they're just doing the next tiktok dance but for politics is the best way i can say it which is dangerous oh it's dangerous because you know they're, yeah. they're they're i mean you you look at the january 6 events you know it, that's how dangerous it can become you know, either yeah. side can become that dangerous, though. Um, yeah. That's the best way. I, it, it can be dangerous. You know, I think people need to be held accountable for what they say. You sh you know, freedom of speech is important, but when you're vilifying a whole subsection of people, uh, to be held into check and balances on that. <laughs> yeah. What's weird is, like, so many of the people that I've had on this podcast, like you, I tend to agree with them on most subjects. I've only had a couple guys that I haven't agreed with. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, like, once again, from my perspective, everything, not everything, I know there's a lot of like bad stuff going on, but everything seems to be kind of okay. I don't know if that's because I'm finding people off of Reddit and I know Reddit tends supposedly tends to be more like liberal, even though you probably don't even use Reddit all that much, but um, so yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, part of it was when you were talking about you doing the YouTube stuff and same with me, it kind of makes you wonder like, hmm, maybe I should, because they're making a ton of money. Maybe I should be one of, I don't want to say be a grifter, but like you could just go on and talk about the yeah. left and, and all the stuff that you're knowledgeable on, you know, global yeah. warming and all that. I, I, I think they have a skill. I think they have a certain skill that makes them good at what they do you know i grew up playing baseball throughout high school a little bit in college and it's easy for me to sit back and watch like mlb and be like, ah, i can do that i can hit that you know 93 mile an hour slider on the outside yeah. you know I, it, 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 it there's a tendency of luck that comes behind it you know yes there is the factor of like sitting down and grinding and doing you know the left uh, media definitely is lacking when it comes to those, you know, more prominent uh, faces in the left. You know, really, if I if I had to mention all the left uh, YouTubers or even just multimedia persons, uh, Hassan Piker is the only one I'm going to mention. He's the only one that's really in the the atmosphere. Well, so, that's what's weird. Yeah, as you were saying, there's a bun a bunch on both sides, but I can't name too many on the left. It's mostly on. The yeah, right, you know, right? Hassan really is kind of the uh, the outlier of the left left voice for you know multimedia and social media as a whole. Um, man, this is a you know I <laughs> it's not a lot I know about. Um, I definitely think it's interesting. I think you know it might be a little bit of un under representation of the left leaning, and I think that might be why it doesn't hit with you know younger generations or not even younger generation but you know the middle age generations and you know the 30 to you know 50 year old generation you usually tends to lean more right towards you know that might be because there's not a lot of representation in that media of lean left-leaning voices that's my best way of analyzing the situation <laughs> yeah it's a it's it's a complex question that i like threw in there at the last minute just to since we kind of brought up politics and stuff, but so I have like three quick, well, 
we'll try and go over them quickly, but three last questions um, will be for one is um, SeaWorld and stuff like that. So you have to, the people who work at SeaWorld are marine biologists, right? So you could technically go work at SeaWorld, right? Um, yeah, I think they're, I think they're marine biologists. You know, they, they have zoo vets and all that aspect. Um, I've never worked, you know, hands-on, you know, one-on-one with someone who's worked at SeaWorld. Well, what what are your thoughts on places like, because I know a lot of people look down on SeaWorld and the, and the zoos and all that. Are you kind of against those type of um, organizations or whatever? <sighs> um, you know, I, I volunteer with a, a conservation group, which we house certain species of turtles. Um, you know, people don't like that we house these certain species of turtles. Um, I, I explained to these people, you know, the, the the turtles that we have on site were from predated nest. They've been raised in captivity. They've only ever lived in captivity. They only know captivity. They they would not be able to survive in the wild. That's why they, you know, reside within that organization. Um, as far as SeaWorld, man, I don't really have any like. Um, I'm not gonna like show up to SeaWorld protest, honestly. I think um what they used to do was pretty bad. I think they've learned from it. I think they're trying to go more of an education route. Um, they kind of got their lumps. They got beat up. They they they're they're trying to improve that image. Um, I don't really have any super strong you know, opinions on SeaWorld in the current state, which in they're in, you know, if you asked me back in the eighties, like, yeah, screw those guys. <laughs> yeah. And then in terms of being for people out there who want to be a Marine biologist, like you said, it is a depressing job, but well, first of all, in order to do the job, do you have to do what you're doing, which is, do you have to be willing to go in, to the ocean with sharks or no there's a lot of people who don't do that that's no. your specific job i re- i'll tell a funny story we were uh i was getting my advanced uh scuba certs and it's nothing special it just permits you to go a little deeper when you're diving and i was with a group uh with marine biologists and i don't know, i don't know if you know what a remora is it's a shark sucker it's usually those fish you see on the side of sharks and- um no no it's just like a long silver fish. They got a flat head, literally can suction themselves and onto anything. And, you know, we're rolling off the boat, rolling off the boat. And a lot of times when it's deeper water, you're going to have an anchor. Oh, you're going to have an anchor line. And you just sit on the anchor line waiting for everyone to roll into the water. And a remora started swimming up to, you know, the other marine biologist. And some of these marine biologists freaked out. You know, they're not used to dealing with wildlife. They're not used to that situation. You know, I know some marine biologists who are perfectly fine with just working at a desk, doing data analysis, data entry. You know, I know marine biologists that are perfectly like knowledgeable on how I, how to like code in R. You know, they know all these coding languages. Um and then I know other marine biologists who say they'll never learn how to code. You know, it's such, it's, it's a wide field. Um, you know, unfortunately it is kind of turning into the fact that you have to get a master's and a PhD to get a livable wage nowadays, unless you get super lucky. Um, you know, people that really want to do it, don't do it for the money. Don't do it for the the work-life balance don't do it for an easy job but you know i don't think anyone goes into this field thinking it's going to be an easy job um but yeah in terms of in terms of money and hours how much does it pay like you don't understand how much you make but like in general what's like the average pay of like a marine biologist would you say with like a bachelor's well with a bachelor's like you're looking at 30 if you're lucky okay and you're so working it's... you're working overtime unpaid. How, how do they get away with not paying you overtime? They know you're passionate. 
Oh man. They know you're going to take it home and do a little extra. Yeah. So in terms of the future of the ocean and the, the sharks and the fish and going back to the con- conservation, um, from you actually being out there in the field, are you kind of like actively, I think you said before you are, that we are seeing things degrade. Um, and then also going back to the, the global warming thing, um, what are some things that you feel like we can do about it to save the planet and the oceans mm-hmm. and everything? Um, as far as like, environment degradation you know i obviously am out there so much that it's more obvious to me it's more obvious to people who are out there day to day what's changing over a long period of time but you know the data is kind of saying it um i, I but you know is i don't want to be just 1000 percent debbie downer 1000 percent. you know we're screwed um there's so much that we can do you know I think in the last two, three years, looking at the big shift of getting away from plastic, single-use plastic and everything, and how, you know, we've kind of rallied against or rallied around those aspects. Um, I do have hope, you know, I'm I'm not hopeless (laughs) when it comes to this job. Um, I think we could uh, easily do a lot to impact what impacts we have to the ocean, what impacts we have to, you know, our coastal marine systems and everything like that. Um, you know, as far as what you can do day to day, you know, look at what fish you're eating, you know, make sure you're not eating at risk species, make sure you're not, you know, look at the companies you're buying from, you know, some companies are better than others when it comes to, you know, how they impact environments. Um, you know, try and limit your seafood intake, you know, I'm not telling you what to eat, how to eat, you know, I like meat. Um, I eat seafood every now and then, but I'm not going out and eating salmon every meal. Um, you know, just kind of be more conscious of what you do, how it impacts, um, the environment and the ocean specifically. Okay, cool. And then in terms, this is kind of like a personal question or any drone photographers out there. If I, if I want to go to the beach and you know, like I said before, it would be awesome to, you know, get a shark or a whale, you know, um, what are my best bets for, for getting it with the drone? Like, like how far out do I have to go? Um, are there certain maybe areas that I can like look for that they yeah. tend to go to? Um, you know, with the sharks, I can speak on, uh, you know, second sandbar, right where that second wave breaks at, you know, they're going to be playing in that waves they're going to be playing right at that sandbar they're going to be chasing bait fish up to that second sandbar and uh predating on them with whales i don't know i actually have never really worked with whales um and i also don't really know anything about the california coast yeah um you know just like with any wildlife photography it's all about luck you know when i lived in alaska i could take beautiful pictures of anything i wanted to because it was alaska but now here it's it's a fight (laughs) to try and get any good photography or any good shots of anything that's a whole other thing you lived in alaska where were you in alaska i lived on an island and i was raising salmon to be released back into the wild to help with native populations oh man that's a whole other thing yeah Yeah, i could could talk about living like remote alaska for a thousand hours (laughs) Well, if you ever want to come back on to talk about that, I follow this guy on Instagram named John Dirty. Mm-hmm. And I kind I don't know if you, you probably haven't heard of him, but he he's big on Instagram and TikTok. But man, he lives in Alaska and some of his some of his videos are just insane. And I, I kind of like learned from him to he I think he uses like a long GoPro pole, and then he'll be able to kind of like stick it into the water or kind of like okay. move it around further. And he gets just some crazy visuals. And it's like, man, I I mean, Southern California is a, an okay place, but man, Alaska, that's a, that's that's a, a whole beautiful place. Game. It's a whole oh, different yeah. ball game. Everyone's a good photographer in Alaska is what I say. <laughs> part of me, yeah, part of me wants to move somewhere like that or even or even like Portland or um, or Washington, Seattle, or like what 
you know, I was saying before, even Florida has some like really beautiful places I've seen. Mm-hmm. And it, like I said, it's pretty here, but it's like, okay, so our mountains doesn't, they don't get too much snow. So we have the mountains like big mm-hmm. bear. We have um, the desert, like Palm Springs, like Joshua tree. Mm-hmm. And then we have the ocean and all of it's like, I'm an hour or two away from like pretty cool spots. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, as you know, it's kind of known that like the LA area, the Southern California area just isn't super clean. Like we don't have like very much clean water, like at all. Like the ocean isn't clean. The, yeah. uh, the lakes aren't clean. We have to go to like, Yos- yeah, we have to go to like Yosemite to find that. So lastly, um, the final questions, I promise. I always ask people if you want to plug Anything that you do, you mentioned your film, your podcast, mm-hmm. whatever you do. And then also anything that you're into in terms of podcasting, it could be anything, podcasting, music, movies, TV shows, whatever you want to get out there. I'm always looking for things to watch or yeah. listen to. Like I said before, um, if you're more interested in more casual conversation, you know, I don't talk too much science on my other podcasts. You know, I try and get my science talk out on hosting and co-hosting with other people on podcast. Um, but I do a podcast with my friend in college, super different vibe, but it's called low Celts esteem S E L T Z esteem podcast. Um, we just recorded a couple episodes. They should be going up soon. Um, you know, as far as, uh, what to watch and, you know, I'm, I'm very biased, but, I think the best to ever do it when it comes to ocean documentaries, Jacques Cousteau. I grew up watching Jacques Cousteau from a little, little age. I still admire him, even though he has some problematic past. Um, he's learned from it. You know, I, I, I've i listened to a lot about him. I'm very knowledgeable on Jacques Cousteau. A lot of his documentaries are free on YouTube. You can just look up Jacques Cousteau uh, documentary. I recommend watching it. You know, he's a Frenchman. He has that eye for cinematography. He makes some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful documentaries. He doesn't just talk about the ocean. He talks about, you know, so many aspects on the ocean, you know, how he sets up his shots for certain shots on like a garden eel. He talks about the whole process of photography, doing photography on garden eels or doing uh, recordings of salmon swimming upstream in Alaska. He's just really interesting documentaries back in the, you know, I think it was like the 60s. I couldn't tell you, you know, um, music. I don't know. I listened to a lot of weird stuff. Um, but yeah, th- th- those would be my two plugs. Okay, cool. In, term- in terms of music, you look kind of like a, um, I was going to say like a, almost like a Beach Boys, like John <laughs> Lennon kind of look. Are you um, into like? I'm a, I'm a pump, uh, punk rock. Pop okay. punk rock. Um, oh, okay. If if I had to tell anyone, my favorite uh, band in the world is Dollar Signs, and they uh, I heard of them. they're a they're a pop punk rock uh, band, and they just complain about having office jobs, and I find it hilarious. Um, they talk about a lot about mental health, and I'm super passionate about mental health. Um, yeah, Dollar Signs can't recommend them enough. Big big fan of Dollar Signs. Uh, my buddy has a band. Small. They're pretty small. Yeah. Uh, my buddy has a band called Cosmic Highway. Their most recent album is, can you know that beach rock? But it's like psychedelic beach rock. Big fan of that album. Um, is it kind of yeah. like kind of like like Waves? Have you heard of the band Waves? Uh, I haven't heard of that one. You should check them out. It sounds similar, kind of like psychedelic I'll check beach rock, surf rock. Yeah. What about like in terms of pop punk? What are you into like like Blink One Eight Two type stuff? All that. Oh kind of yeah, stuff? all that stuff. You know, the trashier yeah. the better. <laughs> Yeah, they were they were my favorite band for a long time. Not anymore in terms of their new music, but probably I don't think top, I've heard the new stuff sounds stuff. good. Like, you know, I don't know if you know, but Tom DeLonge like rejoined the band. Yeah, I heard about that. And their new stuff isn't as good, but and then like you know, I'm I'm into all I was like really big into pop punk too, like a long time ago, a while ago and fallout boy and panic yeah. and disco all that kind of stuff you, you yeah. had like the the peak of it yeah exactly you know how old i am did, did i age myself no you didn't <laughs> oh, oh oh you just know because of that period yeah yeah yeah. yeah. that was 
literally, literally the pink. I was in yeah, the you're peak in the blink, pink. Yeah, blink one eighty two and all that. Yeah. Unfortunately, I just can't get into too much modern music, and that's why. That's why I ask because I'm I'm always looking for new stuff to listen to. But recommend dollar Anyways, signs. I'll check them out. Where are they from? When they come out and all that. Uh, they're from Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, when was their first album? Let me look them up. I've been listening to them oh since college. I I, I actually went to a concert of their or concert a gig of theirs. You know, it was in like a little trashy bar and everything. And the t- first album was 2015. Um, I went to a gig of theirs and I was like singing every song of theirs. And like, I was like five feet away from them. And I was like singing to my girlfriend, one of their songs. And I remember looking around and I look at her and her eyes are literally like the size of dinner plates. And I turn around and like the bassist guitarist is like behind me and he's got his guitar handed out to me. And I like, yeah, I don't know how to play guitar. I just like strum it for like five minutes with him. I'm like up on the, the stage and everything, having a great time. They got like one part of their song, uh, everyone will love you if you drink a PBR out of your shoe. So I did like a shoey of PBR. <laughs> it was a fun time. They're they're a good band. They they have fun. <laughs> what what are some of the new what are some of the newer like pop? I don't even know what if like the new pop punk oh. bands. Like would like Machine Gun Kelly almost be like in that? Like I feel like he kind of turned pop punk. Yeah. Oh goodness. Pop punk, what I, I listen to more like on the indie side of the pop punk. Um, Dollar Signs really is, in my opinion, like the the best of the pop punk in this current age. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then yeah, I would love to have you back on. I think we to more, we could probably go over some other stuff because you know I I was out of my depth with marine biology, didn't know too much questions to ask, but um. And then, yeah, I would love to talk with you about your experience on an island in Alaska. So oh, real sure. quick, and then we'll end it. Where did where did you grow up? Like, did you grow up in Florida and then go there and come back? Or I'm from Tennessee, landlocked. Tennessee. I'm a landlocked Tennessean. So Tennessee to Alaska. To Florida. Tennessee to, to Florida. Florida. Studied in Florida. Worked a little bit in Florida. Went to Alaska. Came back to Florida with my current job. How long were you in Alaska for? Half a year. Was that just kind of like a passion project or to make money or what? Make money. Yeah, I made good money. I was living on an island. I didn't buy anything. I banked all the money. I worked 24-7 basically to make as much money as possible. Yeah. What island was it? I want to look it up. Uh, I worked in Evans Island, which is in Prince William Sound. And then I also worked in Main Bay, Alaska, which is also in the Sound. Was it rough out there, like to live on an island out yeah. there? Um, there are certain days that were definitely more rough. You know, you had to order your beer a month in advance to come on a boat. <laughs> um, you know, there'd be days where, and I was, it was a lot of a uh, more manual labor, more you know, maintenance and learning how to work with tools and everything. Um, I was like rebuilding a whole floating dock with me and a couple buddies out in the ocean during a blizzard total whiteout so we contracted a, a fishing boat a crabbing boat because this was out of crabbing season and they came out dropped anchor and just put on those big spotlights onto the floating dock and you know we're just you know working on the dock trying to repair it well there's a big blizzard going on was it kind of similar to that tv show i'm, I'm forgetting the name the, mike flanagan he did um it was on netflix like they basically they lived on like a small little island but i think it was off i think it was off the coast of like you know the east coast yeah it's probably around the same same vibe same same idea very small there's not many people lived there they had to have a boat bring everything the only people that lived there were the other workers and there was like 20 of us at max yeah and then in terms of the hurricane i keep extending this but i know you mentioned that did that hit you pretty hard yeah the florida hurricane yeah it was rough. Were you just were you just locked inside the house or what? Like how, how was we that? got out of there. Uh we got out of there for that one. Um, uh, and you know, we had a buddy that luckily had like a small aircraft and could like literally he like flew over where my parents lived and was able to like he had a long DSLR with like a 300 lens on it and was able to like stick his head out the aircraft and take pictures of like all his friends' houses to see if people's houses were still up and uh 
doing well. But luckily, my parents' house was fine. You know, the housing, the the research housing got hit really hard and destroyed. So we had to find different housing more in town. All right. Um, so you you did stay local. You didn't have to get out of like out of the state or anything. No, we went more towards the west coast of Florida. Get out of the the path. Okay. Okay. All right, Joseph. Well, it was nice talking to you. And yeah, if you ever want to come back on to talk about anything and everything let me know <laughs> definitely i'm i'm free most saturdays i'll let you know all right sweet man thanks for listening guys talk to you next time bye